Well, it's amazing. Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. It's the sizzle and the dizzle once again. David Wood, Sam Shimon. We are going to talk about Zucker Nike, ladies and gentlemen. Zucker Nike, the man who has never faced one actual debater in his entire career, uh, but is somehow known as a champion debater. And this is very, very interesting. But uh, Zucker Nike commented on us recently saying that we're basically not, you know, we're not good enough to, we're not at his level. And uh, the re it's interesting, the reason Zakir Naik finally had to comment was Muslims for years have been going to him, could you please refute these Christian apologists? Why don't you take out uh, Sam Shamoon and David Wood and Christian Prince and James White and Jay Smith and William Lane Craig? Why don't you take, why don't you take out these Christian apologists? And for years, Zucker Knight, no, they're beneath me. They're not good enough for me. They will not bring 20,000 or a million or however many he wants to, to uh, a debate. Uh, they won't do it. Therefore, they're, they're unworthy of me. When this guy has never faced one actual, <laughs> one actual debater in his entire career. Uh, so when, when you, you'll notice when, when Zucker Knight faces anyone, it's either one, someone who doesn't know anything about Islam, or two, someone that he can overpower with rhetoric. Those are the two categories. You'll never, you've never once seen him face someone who has carefully studied Islam and who can match his level of rhetoric. Never once, never yeah. once, and he never will. He was, uh, it's actually a brilliant tactic. Years ago, he debated like two or three people. And Sam, I found this out because back when I started, I kept hearing, oh, Zakir Naik is the guy who's schooling everyone. Zakir Naik is the one who's crushing all, all the Christians. And Muslims kept telling me, Zakir Naik has refuted all of your best, all of your best debaters. I said, oh, really? So I went and I ordered the Zucker Nike collection on DVD. I got the Zucker Nike debate collection. And I was like, cool, now I get to see all these debates. And I got it, and there were two debates on there, the rest were lectures. I was like, wait, did they leave all of the debates out by accident? What, mm -hmm. what happened? I, I heard he's been going around debating everyone for all these years. What's going on? And uh, turns out more like he's debated two people way back in the day, and then has never but has never once faced an actual experienced christian debater even though everyone's challenged him and so uh he's responding and saying oh david wood's trying to get attention guys my claim has never been zucker knight needs to debate needs to debate me it's just right. could he debate one actual debater and sam i don't mean yeah. to hurt your i don't mean to hurt your feelings no i don't mean to hurt no. your feelings here but i know how you feel about bruce lee oh man don't say that man don't go and you know, you know how I, you know how I feel about Bruce Lee, right? Yeah, man. And uh, you believe that Bruce is the best ever, and my position is not that he's not. My position is until I see him take a punch to the face, I don't know. So until I actually see a man in a fight, I don't, yeah. I, I just, yeah. I just don't know. Um, so this is kind of an odd comparison to make to Zucker Knight because Zucker Knight is nowhere on the level. You know, if you're comparing, you know, martial arts world and apologetics world or scholarly, you know, scholar of religion world, Zucker Nike is nowhere near Bruce Lee. He's he's kind of a he's more like one of these guys who. What would we compare him to? What would he be in like the martial arts world? He, he'd be like, a, you know who he'd be? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you who. <laughs> you, you tell me who you're thinking of, and then I'll tell you who I'm thinking of. Frank, the, the guy, Frank. Oh, Dukes. Frank Dukes. Frank Dukes. There you go. Oh, perfect. No, that, that's better than the one I came up with. Yeah, Frank Dukes, man. I had someone else in mind, but Frank Dukes. Frank Dukes. Oh, man. Zucker Knight, the Frank Dukes of Islamic apologetics. You guys remember who Frank Dukes is? That's the guy who was famous. Uh, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme played him in uh, Bloodsport. And yeah. supposedly, you know, uh, Frank Dukes came back and was telling all these stories about how he's undefeated. And he went to the Kumite and dominated, dominated the Kumite and all this stuff. He's telling all these stories about all these people he's destroyed. And then, you know, he's he's on the cover of magazines and he's doing interviews about how he's destroyed everyone. Turns out no one could find any evidence that he'd ever fought anyone. And he still claims that it's all true, but no one could find a shred of evidence that he'd ever been anywhere or fought any of the people that, that he was claiming that he'd fought. And so, uh, yeah, I was going to use the example of there, there's this young boxer who claims that he's actually the champion of the world. And he's destroyed everyone. And uh, basically he goes around to different dojos, says he wants to spar just do some light sparring. And as soon as they start, he tries to annihilate the person with like, you know, a sucker punch. And then the person realizes what's going on, beats him up, and he runs out and claims that he's a champion. So that's what I was, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. But ladies and gentlemen, 
we're pretty laid back. We're pretty laid back. And let people now, guys. We were not trying to talk about Bruce Lee. We were trying exactly. not. We were not trying to talk about Bruce Lee. My my point is, yes, we've. If it was just his movies, I would not say we could we could make any sort of judgment because you can make you could make um, you could make a movie starring David Wood and Sam Shimon, and we would look like the greatest martial arts masters in the world because we would have we, it would be choreographed yeah. that way. But as Sam often points out, people who knew him said that he was really, really, really good. So yeah. people that I do trust say that Bruce is really, really, really phenomenal. But again. Until I see you get punched in the until I see you get punched in the jaw or kicked in the jaw, I don't know if you can actually uh, stand up in a in a fight. So don't know, yeah. right? But anyway, that's how that's kind of yeah. Charlie Zelenoff. <laughs> Natali uh, Abella said it's Charlie Zelenoff. That's the guy who who claims he's like two hundred and something and O oh, in fighting. <laughs> so yeah. you know what's funny? He went and challenged uh, Floyd Mayweather's dad. So Floyd Mayweather's <laughs> dad started tagging him. And anyway, he's claiming that he's beating all these guys. Anyway, that's what we hear about the the, the wonderful Zakir Naik. But this is Muhammad Week. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, what happened was, uh, notice that on Monday we had Hatsun on with us. And today we're just going to be going through some Zakir Naik clips. And the reason was on, on both those occasions, there was a, a Muslim, his name's Rasul. I'm not going to pay attention to him anymore. But he was saying he wanted to be on and then would not make the final confirmation until we got a few hours away from actually having to go live and would not finally confirm that he's ready. And then so I just had to, to arrange a different topic. But he did that Monday and Wednesday. Was I was waiting for him until kind of the last, you know, the, the last second before I had to set up the live stream and uh, ended up not not coming through. So uh, right. so anyway, it sucks because I reserved those spots. There were other Muslims who could have who could have done it at that time. I reserved it for him and then never actually showed up. So. But we do have Muslims who are going to be on Thursday and Friday. So we have Muslims who are... And tomorrow we're having a discussion with a young Muslim convert to Islam who would like to just have a discussion. So we'll have a nice, uh, nice friendly discussion. And yes. then Friday is another Muslim who wants to talk about whether Muhammad uh, was actually violent and whether he is a good uh, role model morally for people. So that, that was his topic. I asked him what topic he wants to talk about, and that's that's what he chose all right so we are actually going to talk about zucker nike we're going to go through some clips sam why don't you I, i've been i've been yeah. uh, babbling here for the introduction no, I, yeah, but what do you think what do you think context, about zucker yeah. i want to put in context but let's just again ask the father of our lord jesus to bless us in jesus name for the glory of your son father wash us in the blood of the lamb the lord jesus your heart who, be, who became flesh for our salvation fill us with your holy spirit father guide david and i to love you and worship you and to speak the truth without error, even when speaking about Islam, so that Jesus will be glorified in the way we live and preach. Give us the zeal to live for the Lord Jesus and die for the Lord Jesus, for he's worthy. We thank you, Father. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, take over for the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I just had to do that because we need the Lord. I desperately need the Lord. I just want to correct one bit of misinformation on the Zachary Knight video. <clears throat> and for the record, and I mean this, I don't really like to debate. People may think I do. I'm not looking for a debate. Honestly, I don't like to debate. I prefer Q&A. I prefer someone asking me a question, even an objection, and let me answering it. I don't like debates, but I'm forced to because Muslims think they can intimidate us. They can bully us and scare us. And for a long period of time, they've been quite successful in intimidating and bullying Christians. So how do you put a bully in his place? You stand up to the bully, and when you stand up to the bully, the bully shows his true colors. That's the only reason why I debate. So for the record, guys, I don't care to debate. If I have to, I will. I prefer not to. So, But the Lord's will be done by the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, with Zachary Nike, he did say something in the video about me. I need to correct David because it's a lie from hell, and I got witnesses to prove it's a lie from hell. It's funny. I, I still I still haven't even watched the video. <laughs> oh yeah, I watched. I just it. I just heard I just heard people tell me about it. Oh, I did oh, I did yeah. want to point out Elizabeth Salvatore said had to search for the live stream, not notified. You were saying that you couldn't even exactly. find it. You couldn't even find yeah. the live stream. So yeah. No. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Even when so. you put li when you played live, it took a minute for it to show up on your channel. So I think you're being shadow banned. Like YouTube, yeah, vocab just got his whole channel demonetized, and uh, yep, yeah. oh, they've been playing with me for a while. But, but go ahead. Yeah, but pray, guys, in Jesus' name, that the Lord will keep this door open to YouTube so that it can be used to glorify Him, because the powers that be are trying to shut down people like David Wood. May it never happen in Jesus' name. I unfortunately had to watch that video. 
because people kept sending it to me and I watched it and uh, made me cringe again. But he did say something. Let me set the record straight for people. And this is the honest to God truth. And I wish he would confront me because we got witnesses. He said to me, he said about me that I said, hey, I want you to debate me. And pretty much he made an excuse. And then I said to him, I want you to debate my mentor, William Campbell, that William Campbell's my mentor. Now, you guys may not know who William Campbell was. He's 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 now gone to be with the Lord. But if you go on Answering Islam, go to AnsweringIslam.net. Look for individual authors. There is a link to an author named Dr. William Campbell. If you guys don't know about Campbell, it's because maybe you've, you were too young. Maybe you weren't even born at, at the time. In the 70s, there was a French, I believe he was French-Canadian, Dr. Maurice Bouquet, who in around 75 wrote a book called The Bible, Quran, and Science, where supposedly as an unbiased Catholic, now don't forget he was the physician for King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, he wrote a book showing that the Bible contains gross scientific mistakes, historical errors, whereas the Quran had no errors and actually foretold modern scientific discoveries such as the developing embryo. So in 75, when he came out with this book, man, the Muslims were eating it up. Look, look, alhamdulillah, the Quran is a miracle. Even this Canadian, French Canadian Catholic admits it. And so they were shoving this book down people's throats. So glory to God. He raised up a man named William Campbell. Hey, hey, so this hey, day, hey, hey Sam, by, by the way, uh, wasn't uh, wasn't uh, wasn't Maurice Bukai uh, on the pay on the payroll of uh, King yeah. Faisal? <laughs> yeah, he was his physician, man. What do you think he's going to write a book attacking Islam? I go mean, ahead, really? Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, you think about it. <laughs> yeah. You're working for. You're going to write a book attacking Islam. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, okay. and, and and little little side note. I know two Christian pastors. One was offered, I believe, $2 million, and the other wasn't offered a specific amount. They said, name your amount. They said, we want you to convert to Islam and write a book about how you were persuaded that the evidence supports Islam, and so you converted. And one was offered $2 million, and the other was said, just name your price. So <laughs> yeah. look at that. And, and said, so you've got these guys, like Maurice Bukai, who actually works for King Faisal. And then he comes out, oh, there's all this evidence for Islam and the Quran sure. and it's scientific miracle. And then they get then they get rich and then Muslims run with it. You see, this proves our religion. What, what a silly religion. Good. Yeah, now again, just remember, double check my facts. It's been a long time. I hope I'm remembering the facts clearly about Dr. Maurice Bukai. But I, from what I know, he did work for King Faisal in Saudi Arabia. But anyway, with that said, God raised up a missionary who was also a doctor named Dr. William Campbell. He wrote a book. It's now online on answering Islam for free. This is one of the books that helped me tremendously. It's called The Quran and the Bible, A Light of History and Science. One of the best books ever written in this regards when it comes to Christian Muslim debates and arguments. He pretty much decimated Bouquet's books, showed all the errors and dishonesty and misinformation. The only problem is William Campbell is not was not a good debater or a good speaker. Now, David knows this. There are some people phenomenal at writing, some people phenomenal at speaking. It's very rare to find someone who can both write and speak on a level that is superb. Campbell was very terrible as a communicator and debater. Unfortunately, Zachary Nyack hunted him down for a debate because William Campbell's book, was giving trouble to Muslims. Christians were reading it, using that book to show Bouquet lied. So Zachary Nayak decided to debate William Campbell, and he debated him, I believe it was 2001. The debate is on, online on YouTube. It was in, in Niles, Illinois, where I pretty much lived in that area, at Niles West High School. Now, unfortunately, the organization that I was affiliated with, South Asian Friendship Center, co-sponsored the debate. I told them before the debate, and there was a Muslim I was witnessing to, his name is Walid. I said, Zachary Naik is going to smoke William Campbell before the debate. He goes, why? I go, because Campbell is not a good speaker. And I said, Naik won't defeat him on facts. He'll defeat him on his showmanship and his ability to tap dance and overwhelm him because Campbell is not a good debater. And exactly like I said, he, unfortunately, Naik pulverized him, overwhelmed him, not because of facts, but because Campbell was too old, too slow, not a gifted speaker. And you know how Nayak is. He'll throw 50 verses all out of context to overwhelm you. 
And so in the eyes of the Muslim, it was a landslide victory. So after the debate, I looked Naik in the, in, you know, in the eye with his students, one of, one of whom was there, I'll even give you his name, was Ayub. Another gentleman was Sabil Ahmed. They're all on YouTube, uh, Sabil Ahmed at least. And I said, here, I'm writing responses for answering Islam to refute you, and I was, and they're online. And I said, when you're ready, I want to debate you, and I will decimate you. I will take you out, and I'll retire you. I go, if you have the guts to debate me. You know what he said? He said, when you can get, was it? He said, one million people to watch you do a lecture, then I'll consider debating you. And in front of the Muslims, I said, you are a wicked coward. You're not a man. But don't worry, I will be after you, and I will discredit you. That's what happened, as the Lord bears witness. So he lied through his teeth when he said, hey, uh, Naik, why don't you debate my mentor, Campbell? So you let him know, Sam Shimon says, you're a liar. Now prove Sam Shimon wrong. Face him. So that's, I just want to put that in context. That's what actually really happened. Yeah, guys, uh, sort of two things here. One, uh, Zakhar Naik is welcome on this program. In fact, uh, we should probably have, maybe next month, a, a Zakhar Naik week. And we could tell Zakhar Naik that he is welcome on, and his students are welcome because he said he doesn't need to debate because his students can debate. But uh, either Zakhar Naik or his students can come on to defend his points and that if they don't show up, then we'll just go through video clips. Uh, we'll go through video clips on different arguments that he gives. And of course, it, it's a hard situation because his fans never seem to ever get the point, right? When I post videos about Zakhar Naik refusing to debate, guess what? Zakhar Naik doesn't have to debate. He's not under any obligation to debate. It's his fans who think he's the champion debater who run to us. Why aren't you addressing? Why won't you face Ch Zucker Knight face to face? It's like, what are you talking about? We'll face yeah. him. No, no problem. Yeah, anytime. Just time. set it up. Set it up right now. And then you finally get the response from him. No, they're, everyone's beneath me. So here's the situation. David and Sam, you're scared to face Zucker Knight. And you ask us. No, we're, we'd be happy to face Zucker Knight. Set it up. And then you ask Zucker Knight. No, they're beneath me. And then the Muslims come back. Ha ha, you're beneath him. So wait a minute. We're running from him. We're scared. And at the same time, we're beneath him. We're not worthy to debate yeah. him. And so th yeah. this is the same level of delusion that we see over and over again. In fact, we're going to see it in these video clips that we're watching, where once again, Zakhar Naik is going to show that Muhammad is mentioned in the Bible, the Bible that's been corrupted and that you can't trust. Remember that from yesterday, guys? Remember that from yes. yesterday? Yeah. Um, They're liars. They're liars. Yeah. Remember, remember uh, how it, it started? Our, 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 our doctor friend, Dr. Shweb, wanted to show that Muhammad's a prophet, and he gives all these Bible prophecies. As soon as Sam started going through those Bible prophecies, he started calling calling them liars. Yeah. So he quoted he quoted the book of John and 1 John. As soon as Sam responded and showed that Muhammad's actually a, a false prophet, according to John and 1 John, John is a liar! You can't trust John! John's a liar! And so, guys, that that's... <laughs> I'm saying that this is the same... This, it's a parallel, right? You guys are running from Zakhar Knight, but you're not good enough to face Zakhar Knight, so Zakhar Knight will never face you! How, how, are, how are, on what planet are we the ones who are running them, right? Mm -hmm. So you have that kind of delusion, but then you find the exact same thing. You should believe in Muhammad because he is prophesied in your Bible. Actually, let us show you all the passages where he's a false prophet according to our Bible. You can't quote the Bible. You can't quote the Bible. It's corrupt. It's been corrupt. It's like, what, what, how does, how does logic work on your planet? We can't figure out. We can't figure out what world you guys live in. Yeah. But can I share another true story? Oh, yeah. No, this is, and you guys. Contact Sabil Ahmed. Sabil Ahmed, I consider him a friend. He also works with Eddie of the Dean Show. If he's going to lie, he'll answer to the Lord because he was there. Folks, I actually had a mini debate with Zachar Naik in a library at Skokie Library. So, guys, please, Sabil Ahmed can be found online. He's still in Chicago. He works with Eddie of the Dean Show, and he works for Y Islam. Guys, I want you to hear this. Now it's recorded. It's archived. So they can call me a liar and expose me and shame me if I'm lying. Okay. Before Zachary Nike debated William Campbell, we had a meeting at Skokie Library in a small room that they rented on the deity of Christ. Remember, at that time, I wasn't as known. Answering Islam was catching on. In 1998, the website Answering Islam was started. And so it was getting the attention of Muslims. And so they challenged the owner of Answering Islam. Shabir Ali actually did. He sent a challenge to Yochan Katz, who started the website. Yochan Katz said, I'm not a debater, I'm a writer. I told Yochan, I'll step in. Let me be, do, be the one to debate. But anyway, because of Answering Islam, it was starting to get to make an impact. At that time, there was no YouTube. Zakhar Naik, Sabil Ahmed, and I believe Ayub was there. 
It's been a while, but I know Sabil was there because he recorded it. I believe Ayub, too, was there. He's also from Illinois. We are in a small room. It was the deity of Christ. And I nailed him on Surah 57, verse 3, and Revelation 1, 17, 18. It even go beyond that. Now, let me explain why that's relevant. In chapter 57, verse 3, one of the names of Allah is that he's the first and the last. So I went to Revelation 1, 17, 18. I said, Jesus, and I read it. I go, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He placed his right hand upon me and said, do not be afraid. I'm the first and last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I live forevermore. I go, here, Jesus says he's the first and last. He died and came to life. Why is Jesus claiming to be the first last when your Quran says only God, God alone, Allah, is the first last? You know what his argument is, it was? Well, first last can mean different things. And yeah, you can call someone first and last and doesn't have to have the same meaning as it does for Allah. I said, prove it. Show me where the Quran made the qualification you did. You're basically a Salafi and you believe in what's called, remember this concept, it's called Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. The oneness of the names and the attributes of Allah. Those names that are unique to Allah cannot be given to a creature. And so, so coincidentally, I, unfortunately I didn't record it, I was stupid. I trusted them. See, that's again my naive, being naive at that time. Sabil recorded it. He had it recorded. And coincidentally, his recording wasn't too good. The sound wasn't good. So when he sent me a copy, it was basically unbearable to listen. So here they are in a room where I schooled Nayak, and supposedly they're going to record it. But when they sent me the copy, it was so bad, you couldn't do anything with it. And so now that mini debate where he got schooled by me, glory to Jesus, is something that's only known between me, Nayak, Sabil Ahmed, and the others there, and the Lord Jesus, because they're going to deny it. And if they're going to deny it, I'll be in their face and saying, you're lying, which actually convinces me why I need to go after Muhammad, because you have no integrity. So I basically did school Nike on the deity of Christ in a private room in Skokie Library. It's, it was there. But unfortunately, I was stupid. I trusted them to record it. Never again. <clears throat> All right. And fortunately, though, um, Zakhar Nike can always come back for a, for a debate with Sam anytime. On stage, on camera, it's very easy. Doesn't have to leave his home. Can do it right now on the internet right. anytime. No problem. We're the ones inviting these guys. And Sam has Sam has basically issued the challenge to everyone to debate whether the Bible teaches the Trinity, whether the Quran teaches Tawheed, and what the Quran says about the Bible. Those are open challenges That's right. to Muhammad Hijab, Ali Dawa, Adnan Rashid, Zakir Naik, Zakir Naik. Shabir Ali, all of them. Yep. Yep. In fact, they said that Farid was stalking your comment section yesterday. Yeah, he was. Yeah, at the, at the, at the end, I said, "Hey, if you, you don't have to be in the comment section, man, you could come. Uh, you could just you just, could just come on live, guys. You under you understand how messed up that is? They're all running, ah, right. these guys are scared, and we're saying, guys, well, you're all welcome. You're all welcome on the on the show. We'll have a discussion. We can have a friendly. We can just have a friendly discussion about this stuff. And no, no, we can't. You're you're not good enough. You're beneath us. You're deceit. You're, you're 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 deceptive. We will not. We you're not worthy worthy of addressing. And yet, uh, yet their channels are filled up with videos responding to us. Right? They've got all the time in the world to make video responses, but no time to actually just go live and and uh, and have a chat. Very very interesting uh, religion here. All right, Sam. Well, should we check out some of these video yes. clips? Yeah. Let me just get one bottled water. And go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So I'll just, I'll just set this up. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we what we're about to watch. I, I looked up again. I didn't have much time because I was hoping that a, a Muslim was supposed to join us uh, this evening, and then it was like I forget what three thirty or four o'clock or something, and I was like, okay, I need to set something up, and so I decided we would just uh, go through Zakir Naik clips. So I looked up Zakir Naik's case for Muhammad or something like that, and got a short video where he was asked, um, "How do you how do you prove?" Hang on, let me, let me see what the exact title is. It was, it's titled, it was, I can't find it right now, but it's titled something like, um, how do you prove Prophet Muhammad to a non-Muslim? Something like that. And so I looked that up and I said, cool, we'll watch that no matter what it is. And notice in this situation, you know that you're getting the best of the best. So Zakir Naik has to give a short video, a short response explaining why non-Muslims should believe that Muhammad's a prophet. And he had clearly, this wasn't in the video, but he had clearly just given a response saying that the most important thing you need to teach the non-Muslim is Tawheed. And then the next question was, well, what's the next most important thing? And that's where you get into Muhammad. So Zakir Naik gives his 
argument for the prophethood of Muhammad. And again, since you had to give a short response, if you have like a three-hour lecture, you can say all, you can say everything you want. But if you have a short video response, then you're kind of you kind of have to lead lead out with your best stuff. So right mm -hmm. now, since Zakir Naik doesn't want to show up, um, we're going to go ahead and look at Zakir Naik's points and see whether he makes a good argument that Muhammad was a prophet, and maybe. Maybe we'll we'll start to realize why Zucker Knight doesn't ever ever want to hmm. face an actual Christian debater. I'm not talking about us. I'm not talking about us. Could uh, could be anyone. Could be anyone. Why would he not want to step on stage with an actual debater? We're about to find out. All right, everyone, ready? All right, let's go ahead and check out our first clip. The first clip is just going to kind of introduce the topic. So we'll uh, we'll play this this first part, and then after that we'll. We'll get into we'll get into some of his some of his arguments. There we go. Dr. Zaka, what is the second most important aspect of Islam that we should convey to the non Muslims when giving dawah? Hmm. After Tawheed, the second most important aspect of Islam is Risalat. Talking about the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The moment you prove to him about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our shahada is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. So, after you convince him about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, take him away from shirk and idol worship, then you have to prove to him about the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad. All right, Sam. So, there at the beginning, he basically said that after Tawheed, yes. the most important thing to show non Muslims is that Muhammad's a prophet. And uh, this has always been interesting to many of us, right? Like, if, if Islam is really just about submit, just about the oneness of God, what in the world yeah. do you need to add all this extra stuff about Muhammad on for? Mm. Like, what? What? Why is it? Why is it? And, and Zakir Naik even said it because you know our shahada is not just that there's one God; it's that one God and you have to believe in Muhammad as well. Yeah. And so it's yeah. uh, why is Muhammad always have to be tacked on there, especially when he adds so much insane stuff. Yeah, now, uh, we've gone through this in the past, but it bears repeating that Islam, if you go to the, the Quran itself, and Christians, you need to learn these arguments. You really need to learn these arguments, because these arguments will put holes in the claim that Islam teaches absolute, pure, they use the word pure monotheism, essentially Unitarianism. We mentioned this passage, we'll mention it again. Chapter 4 of the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 65. If you ask a Muslim, what is Islam? They'll say submission to the one God, Allah. Submission. Complete submission. That's not how the Quran defines it. In chapter 4, verse 65, chapter 4, verse 65, the Quran defines Islam as perfect, complete, total submission and surrender, both internally and externally, to all the decisions of Muhammad. That's chapter 4, verse 65. It's right, it's right there. So, th th Islam cannot be Islam without Muhammad at the centerpiece. So even though they'll tell you they don't worship Muhammad, if you really study the Quran carefully, and I have to say this, the Quran does have a contradictory picture of Muhammad. In one breath, Muhammad is a sinner. He's rebuked by his deity. His deity threatens to kill him and punish him and, and commands him to to seek forgiveness for his sins. So yeah, the Quran does have this contradictory picture. But in the other breath, the Quran says things about Muhammad that elevate him to the status of his God and makes him equal to his God, and if not equal, at least his partner in salvation, so that you can't be a true Muslim without submitting to Muhammad. That's 465. And then 464 is even clearer, because a lot of people read 465, but they don't read 464. And here's the dilemma for Muslims, and the Muslims are listening, and I want Muslims to explain this, and maybe they'll come during the week and come and put us in our place and say, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Muslims, I want you to explain 464 for me. And wh why? Because when we go to 464, it says, we set not an apostle, but to be obeyed, messenger, in accordance with Allah, if they had only when they were unjust to themselves, come unto thee. Now notice, Muslims and Christians, listen. It says, if only they had come to you, Muhammad, because it's supposedly Muhammad here, come to thee. <clears throat> if only they were come to thee and asked Allah's forgiveness, and the apostle had asked forgiveness for them, they would have found Allah indeed off returning most merciful. Now folks, understand 
the condition to being forgiven. Please pay attention. Do you want Allah to forgive you? You need to go to Muhammad, ask Allah to forgive you, and he has to ask for your forgiveness. That's how you know Allah will forgive you. So can I ask you Muslims a question? Since the Quran is a scripture for all peoples and all times till the end of the age, that means these passages are still applicable. They must be applicable for Muslims today who believe in Allah as messenger. So I want to ask you Muslims a question. How do you then go to Muhammad, who's now dead and buried, in order to get him to pray for you to guarantee that Allah will forgive you? Because that's what 464 says. Well, you know what, David? Guess what some Muslim scholars have said? What's that? And this is not this is not me. I want those who can read Arabic, because unfortunately, the English translation of Ibn Kathir, the Salafi translation of Ibn Kathir omitted this narration. But we got Arabic-speaking Christians here, like Rob Christian, who can, who can read Arabic. Rob Christian, a brother who's an apologist. He'll confirm. If you go to the Arabic version of Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir narrates a narration from from the time shortly after Muhammad's death where a man, a Muslim man named Udbi, his name was Udbi, was sleeping by the grave of Muhammad. And then he, a man came to the grave of Muhammad, to the grave of Muhammad, recited 464, and he spoke to Muhammad in the grave and saying, I come seeking your help to pray to Allah to forgive me. And he left. And Udbi in a sleep, had a dream where Muhammad came to him and Muhammad said to it be Utbi, um, go to that man and say his prayer has been heard and Allah has forgiven him. In other words, Muslims on the basis of this passage say you can actually go and visit Muhammad in the grave and ask Muhammad in the grave to ask Allah to forgive you in order to fulfill chapter 4 verse 64. And you're telling me you don't deify Muhammad? Muhammad is not the partner of your God because without Muhammad, God won't forgive you and you won't be a true Muslim. Come on, man. Who are you kidding? And so, um, guys, just, 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 just think about this because this is all part of, it's part of this delusion and in, insanity that we keep, we keep seeing, right? So, so animal here, animal here mentions to, totally different, but notice the keep the same issue keeps coming up. So animal commented yesterday's doctor during yesterday's debate, tried to prohibit Sam from referencing the Quran. Did anyone else catch that, right? So so notice, this seems like a different topic, but it's it's all it's all one topic, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so yesterday, uh, the doctor who was facing Sam, he gives all these arguments from the Bible that supposedly prove his points. And when Sam starts responding, when Sam starts responding to those points, the doctor replies, uh, well, the Bible's been corrupted. These are all liars. You can't use the Bible. And then Sam starts to starts to show, well, if your accusation is that they're liars, let me show you what the Quran says about Allah. He says, why are you quoting the, why are you quoting the Quran? It's a debate about Muhammad. And the doc, one of the doctor's arguments for Muhammad is that the Quran has to be the word of God. And Sam's not, <laughs> Sam's not allowed to quote the Quran, right? So this is what I mean, right? Guys, think about this insanity. So no, notice a couple things here. You're, you're responding to the argument that Muhammad's a prophet, but you can't quote the Quran, which is supposedly Muhammad's revelation. I'm going to show you that Muhammad is a prophet from the Bible, but if you quote the Bible to show that I'm wrong and that Muhammad's a false prophet, the Bible's, the Bible's nothing but lies. You can't trust it. How would you trust, how would you trust such a book? Right? And then we get to the Islam, the religion of pure monotheism. The, the, the religion of pure submission to the one God. How do you submit to the one God? Muhammad told you. You have to believe and do everything I say without question, without having any doubt. If you submit to everyone, this is Muhammad speaking, if you submit to every sexually perverse fantasy I have and agree to do every <laughs> single word I say, every single thing, that's how you submit to God. By doing everything I say, by giving me everything I want. That's Muhammad. <laughs> And do, do you see do you see the level of insanity here how do you submit to the one true god by doing everything this man says it, by fulfilling all of this man's desires <laughs> what is this? Hey, by this the way is you know I, good i was gonna ask this guy to help me lose he said i can go from 100 kilos to 70 kilos man i was like hey man if you can do that maybe at least he could do that right because he mm -hmm. said he can cure diabetes you don't need medicine. Couple of months, I'll cure diabetes. Sam, you you, yeah. you you can you can have the Islam diet. Just every time, every time one of these Muslim apologists contradicts himself, do a push-up. 
you be you be you be Schwarzenegger, man. You be Schwarzenegger <laughs> in three months. <laughs> yeah, he was hilarious, that guy. He can uh, cure your diabetes. He can make you go from 100 kilo to 70 kilo. And you know, Muhammad is a prophet. You know, because liars uh, confirm he's a prophet. So liars confirm Muhammad is a prophet, and that's how we know he's true. Yep. If you quote John to prove that Muhammad's a prophet, it's good stuff. If uh, if you quote him to refute the point that a Muslim just made, can't trust it. It's a lie. Uh, but but Sam, you've been refuted here. Before we continue in the video, uh, Nita um, Nita Nita said the Arabic version of Ibn Kathir has weak narratives. That is the reason why it has been modified. Further, this narrative conflicts with Sahih Hadith and the Quran. Get it? Get it? Now, now here's here's our here's our issue, and, and I'm sure Sam would like to respond as well, Nita. One that was good enough for Ibn Kathir to include. This is good enough for the most respected Muslim commentator of all time to include. So that's one issue. The second issue is we look at things from a, a kind of a different perspective, where you know your 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 uh, Salafi your Salafi editors want to take out things that they find embarrassing. We look at it. We look at it as this is so embarrassing to Islam that there's no way a Muslim invented it and then Muslims passed it on and it ends up in Ibn Kathir. Do you, under, do you understand this, uh, Nita? This is called the principle of embarrassment, meaning that if you find a story and it turns out to be embarrassing for your cause, that actually adds more credibility to the story, right? So if it, so, think about this. Suppose someone's in court because lawyers use this and historians use this. Suppose I'm in court and someone says, um, David, did you steal that candy at the candy store? And suppose my response, I'm on the stand, I'm being accused of stealing candy from a candy store. And I say, no, I couldn't have stolen that candy from the candy store. I was selling crack to kids down at the school. I was selling crack. I couldn't, I could, I was selling crack to kids. I couldn't have stolen that candy. I might actually win my case of, of on, on, the, on the candy charges, right? Because people are going to be thinking, whoa, why would he be, a, why would he make that up? Why would he make up something about him? selling crack to kids. Why would he admit, why would he say that? Why would he make that thing up, right? Well, same principle here. If <laughs> you're telling us that at some point Muslims said, you know what, we're going to make this story up about this dude showing up and praying at the grave of Muhammad, begging Muhammad to forgive him. He, we're, he just, we're just going to make that up. We're going to make up this story about the satanic verses. We're going to make up these stories about Muhammad thinking that he was demon possessed. We're going to make up these stories about Muhammad trying to kill himself over and over and over again. We're going to make up this story about the satanic verses. We're going to make up these stories about Muhammad believing that he's a victim of black magic. We're going to make up all these stories. These are not the kind of star stories that Muslims exactly. would make up. And if a Muslim did make them up, they would kill him. <laughs> the other Muslims would have killed him. The only reason these stories arise and the only reason these stories then get passed on is because the Muslims knew they were true. And so you have stories like this. It's obvious what happened. That happened. That happened. That's that's the reason it ended up in your sources. What are your thoughts on this, Sam? Yeah, <clears throat> several things. Obviously, Nita was not paying attention carefully. Let me repeat First of all, let's deal with the dive. Guys, don't take my word for it. Thank the Lord Jesus for, for YouTube and, uh, you know, the Internet. Just type in Hamza Yusuf, weak hadith. That's all you need. It, there are several now Muslim websites where they've taken an excerpt from a lecture that Hamza Yusuf gave, rebuking those Muslims who try to brush aside a narration because it's classified weak. The Arabic term is daif. See, again, either Nita is, doesn't know too much about the sources, she's parroting what she's learned, or she does, but she's hoping we're ignorant. For those who are not Muslim, you understand Daif means it passed. In other words, it is not forged, it's not fabricated, it's not a lie, and they couldn't get rid of it. <clears throat> there may be a defect in the chain, but it doesn't mean it's not authentic, because if it wasn't authentic, they would simply get rid of it. Even Hamza Yusuf says, the reason why it's there, it's because it passed. So he likens a Sahih to A, A plus, and Hassan to, let's say, A minus B. And he says Daif would be like C or D plus. It passes. It's there. You can't ignore it. So that's number one. Number two, Nira again didn't pay attention. Let's put that aside. Let's say, okay, it's Daif. But that means your Quran is obsolete. Folks, Christians, let me help you understand why these passages prove the Quran cannot be for all mankind and all generations. There are verses that are dependent on Muhammad. In other words, Muhammad has to do something for you. 
in order for you to benefit. 464 says you need to go to Muhammad and ask Allah and Muhammad prays for you to be forgiven. So Nina, I guess you didn't pay attention. How does that passage benefit you? If you're saying that this passage has no benefit apart from the people living at Muhammad's time, then you're saying much of the Quran is useless and obsolete because it has no practical benefit for you today. Then why are those verses there if Muhammad is a messenger for all mankind that will benefit all people in all generations? If you're right that these statements can only be applicable when he's alive, now he's dead and buried, that means he made much of your Quran obsolete. You just destroyed your Quran. You see, you didn't understand the implication. If 464 is no longer applicable, that means it's obsolete. That means now the Quran is da'if. That's weak because it's no longer applicable. And it's not just 464. It's also chapter 24, verse 62. It's also chapter 9, verse 103. Because in 9, 103, it says, Give alms to the Prophet and he'll pray for you. Because his prayer is security for you, and he'll procure forgiveness. But wait, Muhammad is dead. How can I give him alms? How can he pray for me? So you just made chapter 9, verse 103, 2462, Daif. Now you just made your Quran Daif. You made it weak. So that means stop being a Muslimah, get rid of Islam. But now let me add the final icing on the cake. You said that, oh, well, it goes against the Quran. No, it doesn't. If you reject this narration... That Ibn Kathir included. And by the way, can you show me where Ibn Kathir says it's weak? I have it in front of me. I don't see. Maybe I'm missing it. I don't see anywhere where it says it's weak. The very fact he quotes it shows that he approves of it. He didn't say it's weak. But let's say it's weak. Let's just go with it. Here I want to read to you what <clears throat> the Maruful Quran, the Maruful Quran says. Let me get it for you real quickly. Sorry about that. I just lost my place. Oh my goodness. It was right here. I want to read the quote. Oh boy, yep, yeah, the model full Quran, this is my, yeah, yeah, it should be here, yeah, it would be, let me go there, sorry about that guys, I had the quote because I want to read it word for word, I don't want to misquote, Mufti Shafi Usmani, model full Quran, this is a modern Muslim, Mufti Shafi Usmani, model full Quran, volume 2, page 486, so I want to get the right quote, I don't want to just go by memory, I want to read it word for word, and it's on my blog, Answering Islam blog, dot wordpress.com go to answering islam blog dot wordpress.com type in the word utbi u-t-b-i that's all you need to do in the search engine utbi u-t-b-i and the article will come up look what he says about chapter 4 verse 64 now nita tell me that this guy doesn't know what he's talking about even though he's a mufti and he has a commentary on the quran although this verse was revealed in the background of a particular incident relating to hypocrites yet its words yield a general ruling which stipulates that anyone who presents himself, guys pay attention, this is a general ruling, it's not just specific for a particular people, to anyone that presents himself before the Holy Prophet and he prays for his forgiveness, he will be definitely forgiven. And the presence before the Prophet, as it would have been during his blessed life in this mortal world, now David and everyone else pay attention, holds the same effect even today as the visit to the sacred precincts of the mosque of the prophet and the act of presenting oneself before the blessed resident of the sanctified mausoleum falls within the jurisdiction of this rule. Did you guys hear what this mufti said? The mufti said that this passage is applicable and gives you the authority to now go to the grave of Muhammad and present yourself to the grave of Muhammad. And then now he quotes another narration. Not Utbi, but Ali. Sayyidna Ali has said, Sayyidna Ali, this is Muhammad's son-in-law and his first cousin, who became the third caliph, right? I'm sorry, fourth caliph, I apologize. Uthman was the third. Boy, it's too many caliphs. It was Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and then Ali, but then Muawiyah competed with him for the caliphate. The fourth caliph, Muhammad's son-in-law, who was married to Fatima. Sayyidna Ali has said, Three days after we all had finished with the burial of the Messenger of Allah, a villager came and fell down close to the blessed grave. Three days after Muhammad was buried, huh? All right. Okay, so he fell before the grave. Weeping bitterly, he referred to this particular verse. What verse? Chapter 4, verse 64. Of the Quran and addressing himself to the blessed grave, he said, Allah Almighty has promised in this verse that a sinner, if he presented himself before the Rasul of Allah, 
and the Rasul elects to pray for his forgiveness, then he'll be forgiven. Therefore, here I am presenting myself before you so that I may be blessed with your prayer for my forgiveness. People personally present there at that time say that in response to the pleading of the villager, a voice came out, coming out, came out from the sanctified mausoleum, rang around with the words, you have been forgiven. Oh, wow. Ali ibn Abu Talib, the fourth caliph, Muhammad's son-in-law, married to Fatima, says three days after he buried him, a man fell before the grave, started talking to a dead body, and they heard a voice, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, and the voice from the grave of the dead man said, you're forgiven. Who are you kidding? You may try to pull a fast one on people who don't know your sources, but when you're coming to Acts 17 Apologetics, make sure that you're ready because we've studied your sources. See, when David makes a video, he makes sure he studied the issue thoroughly, leaving no stone unturned. And I tr try to do my best to do likewise. I may forget because I'm human. May the Lord Jesus perfect my ability to recall these facts. But you better make sure you've done your research and studied the videos to see if we haven't addressed it. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and a uh, little comment right real quick, and then we'll go on to some more video clips of... Uh, of Zucker Nike. John Wilson, I'm bringing this up because a bunch of people have been commenting on Christian Prince. David, did you listen to Christian Prince's critique? No. About yours and Sam's debate last night with Dr. Shweb Saeed, he wasn't impressed with your moderating. A couple things. One, wasn't supposed to be a debate. It was supposed to be a discussion. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Saeed, uh, Dr. Shweb said uh, that he would like to give a 15-minute presentation when we actually were going live. He said he'd like a little more. But he said he wanted to give a presentation, and then we would have a, a friendly discussion about the presentation. That's what was that's what the situation was supposed to be. So there were no rules. Um, we didn't agree on anything. It was supposed to be friendly discussion. Notice as soon as Sam started critiquing his point, Dr. Schwab started trying to speak over him and shout him down. So that was kind of off the cuff there. Okay, let's break it up into time time limits, right? We'll go back and forth. You don't get to speak while the other person is speaking. Why was I doing that? Because otherwise it would have been a shouting fest. Now, there are people who want a shouting fest. I got messages from people who, you should have just let them go like that because it's more exciting. No, I don't want that. I don't want that. I want, I want people to be able to make their point. So I broke it down into five minutes, five minutes. That was off the cuff. Then the, the next critique is uh, that I've seen from, in the comments is uh, you shouldn't let him go off topic. Guys, kind of depends on what you're trying to do. Again, there were no rules agreed upon. So I'm going to be a little reluctant to enforce rules when there was no agreement, right? I understand the point about keeping him on topic. One, I know who he's going against. I know Sam's going to destroy all his points. Two, I know that him going off topic kind of kind of should be embarrassing to the Muslims, right? I'm sitting here giving you time. Prove that your prophet is a prophet. And, well, the Bible's lies. The, the Bible that you just quoted. So there are people who want to say, uh, you know, Everyone's you should stop it right there. The third thing is, the third thing is, Guys, people are trying to do different things on different channels. You should just you should just crush him and destroy him and make him no one ever want to show up again. That's not my goal. My goal is to make sure that they walk away from here without any excuse whatsoever for why they lost. All right? Amen. What excuse? What excuse can Dr. Schwab walk away from? What 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 excuse can he give right now for why Sam completely obliterated him? What what excuse? If I'd stopped him, he'd have said, ah, "But if he had let me keep going, I was going to make a brilliant point. If he had not cut me off." If you had not cut me off, I, I would have I would have destroyed Sam. Do you see what these Christians did? We're trying to make sure that when we invite Zucker Nike and when we invite all of these Muslim apologists, they have zero excuse. They can't say we're being jerks. They can't say we're we're shouting them down. They can't say we're being unfair. They can't say I'm being unfair or biased in my moderating. If anything, if anything, I'm usually biased in favor of the guest, right? At the end I said, and I'm giving you an ex I'm giving you an extra couple yep. of minutes to, to to conclude. No comments after that. You get the you get the, I'm trying to be biased in favor of them so they have no excuse. So for look, I'm just gonna say, for those of you who no, you need to crush and humiliate and embarrass him so that no one ever wants to join you again and they can all say you're big jerks to them whenever they show up and that can be their excuse to never face you, go to a different channel. That's not what we're doing here. That's not what we're doing here. And let me confirm uh, and I wanna just say his moderating is the best, and I appreciate that he reined me in because you know why? I don't really care about Shuaib, but you see, let me share this again, guys. I've said it, and I'm going to say it again. I'm not just saying it in front of him. God has blessed this guy with a brilliant mind. He is the general patent of Christianity. Notice how he, he thinks. 
if I let Sam pulverize him like Sam would do on his channel, then the Muslim will say, that's why we won't debate Sam. He's rude. He's a jerk, which they already say. He won't let you speak. But you see what he did? No, 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 no. Sam, if I rein him in, he's going to destroy his arguments anyway. So let me rein Sam in. Let me give this guy equal time, if not more time, so that now people don't have an excuse not to come and debate Sam on David's channel. Because if you look at it, the only reason why I lost it yesterday, the only reason is because he went on a tangent and started attacking the Bible. And then I got angry because the focus was on Muhammad. But he did masterful. And I thank the Lord Jesus for David Wood's approach because, folks, had he not done what he did yesterday's debate and with Tisham, you would not have seen the demolition that you did. And now Muslims don't have an excuse. Farid was here. Farid now can't say, well, we can't go on David Wood's channel. He's not fair. He let Sam humiliate the Muslim, attack the Muslim, and shot, silence the Muslim. No, he didn't. He reined me in. Wait, wait, Sam. No, no, Sam. You know, I got frustrated because I wanted to go for the juggler. But his way was best. So I want to give kudos for his method. If there's anyone who should moderate a debate, it's him. But like I said in the beginning, I don't like to debate. I don't want to waste my time debating. I'd rather answer questions. So I just wanted to demolish him in two minutes and send him packing. Thank the Lord he didn't let me have my way. Folks, let me say it again. Let me say it one more time. You want a fair moderator who's going to give Muslims no excuse not to debate? David Wood is the guy. But again, I understand what CP is saying. He's like mm -hmm. me. I just want to demolish a guy in five minutes and move on to something else. But like he said... They're going to use that as an excuse. Mm -hmm. We're never going to go on David Wood. He's not fair. Now, what's their excuse? Zachar Naik, what's your excuse not coming on? Shabr Ali, what's your excuse not coming on? Because this guy's super fair for the other side, and he even has to rein me in and chew me out and put me in my place. What else do you want? Yeah, and, and, and with that said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, notice I don't go around telling other people how to do things. I'm just saying that's how we that's how I'm doing things on this channel because I have certain goals. There, if someone else on another channel says no, when, when someone calls in, you just completely pulverize them. If that's what you're doing on your channel, then that that that's fine. There, 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 there's a place for that. So notice I don't go around everyone. You're, you're, you're all doing it wrong. You need to do it. You need to do it differently. You need to do it my way. It's uh, no, we can do we can have different approaches because we have different goals. And then the people who like that approach can watch uh, that channel. So, again, if you just want if you just if you want a shouting match and want everyone screaming and, and shouting other people down, then th this is probably not the uh, not the channel for you. Go somewhere else. And uh, all right, Sam, before we go on, just because Harvin has been posting this uh, over and over again, Harvin A said, uh, hello, Dr. Wood. I have a quick question. Is corruption of the Jewish and Christian scriptures in any of the strong hadiths? Strong hadiths? None no. whatsoever. The only one, yeah. Yeah. The only one they always misquote is Ibn, Ibn Abbas. Abbas. Yeah. Yeah. So you, no. yeah. So you have, uh, you have Ibn Abbas where um, it, it certainly sounds like, it sounds like, it sounds like he's talking about the corruption of our scriptures. But one, the only way to get that would be to ignore everything else Ibn Abbas says and then to kind of not do a thorough examination of what he's saying in that hadith. Uh, but the other problem is, one, that's Ibn Abbas. Right? That's yeah. not Muhammad. That's not Allah. Uh, all Allah ever does is affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our scriptures. And as far as the hadiths from Muhammad, Muhammad does the same thing. Muhammad does the same thing. And so they have to go to a hadith from Ibn Abbas, who certainly can't overrule Muhammad and Allah, and then they have to go to that, and they have to ignore that their interpretation of Ibn Abbas would contradict Ibn Abbas himself, who affirms that our scriptures cannot be corrupted. So, uh, yeah, so I, I would encourage you to read Sam's, Sam's articles over on Answering Islam because he goes through he goes through all of this. Yeah. All right, yeah. we're ready to we're ready to look at some more. Let's do it. Yeah, let's all do right, it. ladies and gentlemen, and remember the setup here. The question is. After Tawheed, once you've shown the non-Muslim Tawheed, what's the next most important thing? Showing him that Muhammad is a prophet. And so Zakir Naik, he, he, he gets to give his best case that Muhammad is a true prophet. How is he going to do it? Let's take a look. How to prove to the Jews and the Christians about Muhammad If you read the Old Testament, the prophecy of Muhammad is mentioned in the Old Testament. I'll just give the references. Details you can go to our website, irf.net. The Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. The name of Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in the Old Testament, 
in the Song of Solomon, chapter number five, verse number sixteen. Wow! 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 Zucker Nike, huh? Zucker Nike leads off with that, ladies and gentlemen. He leads off with <laughs> moments in the Old Testament. <laughs> and people wonder why he doesn't show up. Sam, yeah. what would happen if Zucker Nike ever faced you in a debate about whether Muhammad's a prophet and he brought up that? Where, Sam, I mean, when, when, it, when, you're, when your average Muslim on the street says, Muhammad is mentioned in Deuteronomy 18.18 18, and in Song of Solomon 516 and in the book of Isaiah 29:12 he, he's mentioned right there when they tell me that you know I think wow this poor guy he bought into a bunch of nonsense lies from a bunch of lying apologists when Zakir Naik or Ahmed Dedat who've read these passages say that I can't help but think the, these guys these guys are lying and they know they're lying and they're lying in order to deceive gullible people and it, it's a version of of what I call the 991 rule they know that if they're talking to 100 listeners Maybe, best case scenario, one out of those 100 will actually look up what they're saying. But then the 99 can just shout down, can shout down the one. If, if he ever says, guys, Zachary Nike's lying here. That's not what these passages are saying at all. Uh, but what do you think would happen if Zachary Nike was, was actually on stage with you yeah. and he was asked, hey, how do you prove that Muhammad's a prophet? And he quoted these passages. Sure. What do you think? What do you think would happen? And does he know yeah. it? My, uh, David, I, I, may, I may sound like I'm being boastful. I'm not, honestly. I boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. If he started quoting that, I'd be pray, singing hallelujah because that means God delivered him into my hands. I would utterly, utterly without mercy. And I'm t and not only him. Uh, that's why I've been begging. I've been hunting down Shibar Ali. I would utterly without mercy decimate them so badly they would look worse than the gentleman yesterday and Itisham. See, people think that Shabir is, well, you know, I know you, you think he's pretty good. Well, he's at least their best. I promise you, if they got on stage with me, they will sound no better than uh, Shuaib yesterday and Itisham because it would be an obliteration by the power of the Holy Spirit. I actually start rejoicing when someone quotes, like when Shuaib yesterday, yeah. when he was quoting John, you don't know what I was saying to myself in my heart. You guys don't know what I was saying. I'm like, oh. No, we I all were, like, right? I was like, oh, yeah, we, I we, go, thank you for Jesus. Thank yeah, you. we had we had no we have we have no idea who this guy is or what his arguments are. So he could be giving you anything. And so the fact that he comes out just like Zucker Nike, what it's like, yeah, cool. Oh, it's yeah. like awesome. And then I was pleasing. And then <laughs> so notice, notice, ladies and gentlemen, once he had locked himself in, these are the Bible prophecies that prove that Muhammad was a prophet. Well, Sam is going to take every single one of those Bible prophecies and show and show Dr. Shuaib that Muhammad's a false prophet. But as soon as Sam gets started, what does Dr. Shuaib do? Ah, the Bible's a bunch of lies. These are all liars. John's a liar. John, that I quoted to prove that Muhammad's a prophet is a liar. Um, <laughs> this That's is, exactly what Nike would do. He'd yeah, do he, would, he would have to. He would. Dr. Nike would have to, right? It, it, he, he would either have to say they're liars or he'd have to say they're all corrupted, right? And it would be a, it would be a situation where he'd have to say, oh, this verse... Yeah, that, that's a true prophecy. But the next verse, you can't believe that. That that's a that's a that's that's been corrupted or that's a lie. He would have to do that because and 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 Muslims would be embarrassed. And Zakir Naik knows this. That's why Zakir Naik has never once in his entire life faced an actual Christian debater. All right, Sam. Well, should we should we take a look at some of these? Oh yeah, let's do it. And we have Deuteronomy. Right? He started with he started with Deuteronomy eighteen. So let me go ahead and. Uh, Let's go ahead and I believe I have the technology to pull this passage up. So Deuteronomy 18, 18. So let's get this whole passage up. We'll read this. We'll read this passage here. Deuteronomy 18. We'll start in verse 15 because many, many Muslims go with verse 15 rather than uh, verse 18. Zachary Nike went with 18, 18, and he mentioned 18, 19. Unfortunately, he didn't mention 1820, which is interesting because Dr. Shoaib yesterday mentioned Deuteronomy 1820. And it's too yeah, bad that he started saying that you can't trust the Bible before we actually got to that one. Because, my goodness, that is the last verse in the Bible you should be quoting if you're trying to defend Muhammad. All right. A new prophet like Moses. Ah, who, who is more like Moses than the prophet Muhammad? Moses had two eyes. Prophet Muhammad had two eyes. Moses had two hands. Prophet Muhammad had two hands. They're, they're basically identical. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. 
That's silly, right. ridiculous argument, dude. All right, here we go. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see his great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So, Zachar and I quoted verse 18. I mean, he, he appealed to verse 18, and he appealed to verse 19. He ignored verse 20, but Dr. Shuaib referenced it yesterday. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And uh, Dr. Shuaib uh, put an interesting twist on that. He seemed to think that the person is going to drop dead when this is, no, this is a death sentence here. This is saying you would be sentenced to death for being a false prophet, not that you're just going to drop dead one day. In, in Jeremiah, that's a separate situ situation. Yeah. Jeremiah gives a prophecy telling this dude that he's going to die for being a <sighs> false prophet. Yeah. All right, now, Sam. Yes. Um, so verse 18 here. I will raise up for them a prophet like you. So raise up for them. And notice who's being referred to here, the Jews. I will be raised up for them. That's, yeah. that's, that's the group that is being talked about. I will yeah. raise up for them, the Jews, a prophet like you, like Moses, from among their brothers, among their brothers, right? Now that's obvious what that means. Uh, my, I've been on with Michael Brown. Michael Brown points out that every single time that phrase is used among their yeah. brothers, always, always, always refers to fellow Jews. You can be brothers in a different sense, but that phrase right there, among their, from among their brothers, always refers to one's fellow Jews in the Torah. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So this is Zachary Knight's warning. Whoever will not listen to the words of the prophet Muhammad, Allah will require it of him. All right, so this is Zakir Naik's, again, we can only assume that this is his best case for Muhammad being a prophet. This is his best case because he's asked, what's your, what, what's your, how would you show a non-Muslim that Muhammad's a prophet? And he leads off with this. What do you think of this passage? Yeah, well, here's what I want to exhort Christians to do. The reason why Muslims get away with misquoting these passages is because sadly, even many Christians haven't been taught to understand context. Number one, if you want irrefutable, conclusive proof that this prophet is an Israelite, not an Ishmaelite, not someone from a foreign nation, notice what verse 19 said, right? <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry. Let, let me go back and read, not verse 19, I meant to say verse 16 to 17. Pay attention to 16 to 17. Sorry, guys, because 19 has also relevance for another reason, but 16 to 17. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more lest I die. Now notice what God says in 17. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. And then he says, I'll raise up a prophet like you from among their brethren. Guys, if you don't know the context, if you go to Exodus 19, there are too many chapters. We're not going to be able to read all of them, but I'm just going to give you the chapters. Read Exodus 19. Read from verse 9. To 25 and then the very next chapter Exodus chapter 20 God appears in a cloud on Mount Horeb he descends on Mount Horeb in a cloud they see see what looks like fire and peals of lightning and thunder and then they heard the voice of God speak audibly they heard God's voice audibly let me just read that relevant section Exodus 20 Verses 18 to 23. Just that relevant section. So you make the connection that it cannot be Muhammad. Exodus 20, verses 18 to 23. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood afar off and said to Moses, You speak to us, we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Now 22, 23, and the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the people of Israel, you have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. 
You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. So you know what this promise is <clears throat> referring to? God is saying, I won't need to show up anymore. Christians, you need to hear the explanation. He's saying, I won't need to show up in a cloud where you see a pillar of cloud by, by day, a pillar of fire by night. I won't need to speak to you audibly anymore. You won't need to hear my voice anymore because even you yourself said just hearing my voice was too much for you to handle. So guess what? I'm going to be raising a prophet like Moses from among you to now communicate to you on my behalf. It's a promise of God for an ongoing <clears throat> succession of prophets that culminate in Jesus Christ. So number one, it's not even... In the, in, in the immediate application about Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. So Christians understand this. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment, but it's an immediate context. It's not only about Jesus. It's about a succession of prophets. That now when Moses dies, I won't need to show up and speak to you audibly. I'm going to send prophets from your brothers to continue to talk to you and relate to you my words. How in the world can this be Muhammad? It is a promise that God, God has given Israel. I won't leave you without a spokesperson to talk to you on my behalf because you don't want me to show up all the time. You don't want to hear my voice audibly all the time. So I'm going to honor that and send you a prophet from the tribes of Israel to communicate my words. And that's what God did. When Moses died, Joshua replaced him. When Joshua died, someone else replaced him until we come to Jesus Christ. So that in itself is proof. It cannot be an Ishmaelite or an Arab because it's a promise to the Israelites. Now, before I move on to any other of the points, Dave, do you want to add something? Uh, no, go ahead. Make, make any other points you want, and then uh, I'll add anything if I, uh, if I want to. Yeah, because I want to thoroughly exhaust this because this response is there tonight. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Number two, the prophet, like Moses, has to be like Moses in these areas. We are told in Deuteronomy 34, 10 to 12, what it means to be a prophet like Moses. Now, I'll, actually, uh, I'll actually, uh, I'll actually, I'll um, actually, I believe I can pull that up. One second. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, we got Deuteronomy 34 pulled up. Okay, 10 to 12, and you'll see right there, English Standard Version. Guys, no, it, it, Moses tells you, the book of Moses, the Deuteronomy tells you what it is to be a prophet like Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. Now, this is talking right about the time of his death. But then you go to Joshua, and there's that prophet like Moses who now succeeds him. But there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, guys, the criteria. A prophet like Moses not only speaks the words of God, but speaks to God directly. Whom the Lord knew face to face directly, spoke to him directly. And I'm going to expound that in a minute. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt. So here's a twofold criteria. The Lord speaks to him directly face to face and does signs and wonders like Moses did. Where? In the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all the servants and to all his land. And for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So the twofold criteria. The Lord spoke to Moses directly. And Moses did signs and wonders, both of which Muhammad miserably fails. And what does it mean that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face? You don't need to guess. Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. Guys, if you learn these arguments, you destroy Islam. You dis destroy Zechariah's apologetic <clears throat> career. It's over for them. Numbers 12, verses 6 to 8. Here it is. What does it mean it's face to face? The Lord came down in a cloud and summoned Miriam and Aaron who were complaining against Moses. That's verse 5. So now notice 6 to 8. And he said, hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, not in riddles. And he beholds, he sees the form of the Lord. He sees the shape, the visible shape, similitude of Jehovah. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? What God did to honor Moses, he entered time and space. He appeared in a pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, allowed Moses to enter the cloud. You'll find that in Exodus 33. You'll find that in Exodus 24. He entered the cloud. 
and he stayed in the cloud 40 days four nights and in the cloud God assumed a shape where Moses was seeing God in a visible shape and just to prove it to you just to prove it to you this Exodus 33 verses 7 to 11 Exodus 33 7 to 11 now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp this is Exodus 33 verses 7 to 11 far off from the camp and he called it the tent of meeting and everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, at, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door, tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people to rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord we used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So guys, you saw it right here. God appeared in a pillar of cloud, allowed Moses to enter the cloud, and in the cloud he saw God assume a visible shape and speak directly to God. So here's my challenge to Muslims and Zechariah. Muslims and Zechariah, quote a single Quranic verse or hadith, where Allah appeared in a pillar of cloud in front of the masses of Muslims and the Muslims saw Muhammad enter the pillar of cloud and heard the voice of Allah audibly. Don't waste your time, it's not there. So Muhammad fails that first criteria. What about miracles like Moses? The Quran, chapter 28, verse 48. Folks, the Quran says Muhammad didn't do miracles like Moses. In 28, verse 48, it says, the unbelievers ask, why isn't he given signs like those of Moses. 28, 48, man, the Quran says, chapter 28, verse 48, they're asking Muhammad, how come you don't have signs like that given to Moses? So the Quran testifies in that twofold criteria, Muhammad cannot be the prophet like Moses because God didn't speak to him face to face. The people didn't see a pillar of cloud like they saw at the time of Moses, nor did they hear God's voice audibly, and he didn't do any miracles like Moses, and that's just the beginning. Of Muhammad's destruction, but I'll stop there and let David uh, say what he wants to say. Um, yeah, I'll just add. Uh, I'll just add one one additional point. So going back to Deuteronomy 18. Whoops. Let me see. Let's see if I can get this up on the screen. There we go. Uh, going back to Deuteronomy 18. Um, the reason it was so hilarious when Dr. Shuaib quoted verse 20 last night. Uh, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. That same hmm. prophet shall die. So, notice you have two criteria of a false prophet here. If you speak in the name of other gods, you speak in the name of other gods, in other words, you promote polytheism, then that would be a death sentence, you're a false prophet. Or... If you speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, in other words, if you say this is from God when it's not actually from God, you deliver a revelation that's not actually from God, those are two criteria of a false prophet, and that would be a death sentence, according to this passage. The same verse, the same verse that Dr. Schwab quoted last night, and the verse after the two verses that Zachary Knight just, just cited. He cited Deuteronomy 18.18 18 and Deuteronomy 18.19. Well, what about verse number 20? Gives us two criteria of a false prophet. Notice, since both Zachary Knight and pretty much all other Muslim apologists agree that Deuteronomy 18.18 18 through 19 are the inspired word of God that vindicate Muhammad somehow, you can't ignore verse 20. What does verse 20 say? Well, you've got two criteria of a false prophet. Someone speaks in the name of other gods, false prophet. Promotes polytheism, false prophet. Deliver a revelation that didn't actually come from God, and you're supposedly speaking in the name of God, false prophet. Either way, the, the, there would be a death sentence. If you did this in the presence of Moses, Moses would order the people to pick up stones and stone you to death as a false prophet. Muhammad meets both of these criteria of a false prophet. Muhammad did them both in the incident of the satanic verses. The story of the Satanic Verses, which, again, I, I, I now have 50 Muslim sources on the Satanic Verses. Basically, Muhammad was a 
prophet who was rejected by his own tribe in Mecca. He was longing for a revelation that would convince his tribe to convert to Islam. Well, he eventually received what he was looking for. He got verses of the Quran. He revealed this as part of the Quran, the word of Allah. And he revealed to his followers, have you not heard of Allah, Alus, and Manat, these three pagan goddesses? He said, these are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So these three pagan goddesses, Muhammad received a revelation saying that Muslims could pray to these three pagan goddesses because these pagan goddesses could intercede for you. And they're described as birds because the idea is that they, would, they, they could carry your prayers up to the great God Allah. Muhammad received these, this revelation. He delivered it to his followers. His followers bowed down in honor of the revelation. And then the pagans bowed down too because they all were happy that Muhammad was now promoting polytheism and promoting belief and prayers to these three pagan goddesses. And later, of course, Muhammad received a revelation from the angel Gabriel telling him that he had been tricked and deceived and that these revelations actually came from the devil himself. Now, let me give you a quotation from Muhammad. This is from the History of At-Tabari, Volume 6, page 111. After Muhammad is rebuked by Gabriel, he says, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. So what did Muhammad do? He received a revelation delivered a revelation that didn't actually come from God, said it was from God, even though it promoted belief in three pagan goddesses. So he promoted polytheism, told people that they can pray to these three pagan goddesses. And what does he say? I've fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. So Muhammad says, guys, I delivered a revelation that did not come from God. I promoted polytheism when I shouldn't have. Well, what, what did he do there? He spoke in the names of other gods, and he delivered a revelation that didn't actually come from God. What does Deuteronomy 18.20 say one more time? But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. According to the passage, according to the passage that Zakir Naik quotes to show that Muhammad's a prophet, Muhammad would have been would have been stoned to death as a false prophet. If he had fortunately for Muhammad, he was among pagans. He was among pagans at the time, and the pagans were overjoyed that he was promoting polytheism. If he had said those words during the time of Moses, Moses would have said, "Everyone, pick up a stone and and, and stone this man to death because he's an obvious false prophet. He just spoke in the name of other gods, and and he delivered a revelation that didn't come from God. He's a false prophet. He meets the criteria." Deuteronomy 18. In other words, if you said, Moses, why are you stoning this guy to death? He would have said, Deuteronomy 18. Here we are, <laughs> all these years later. Zachar Naik, why do you believe in Muhammad? Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Proves that he's a prophet. He would have been stoned to death for that false revelation, but he's a prophet. Do you guys understand what we're talking about when we say this is absolutely insane? He goes to a passage that says that Muhammad would have been stoned to death. And says that this proves that he's a prophet. And that's what he, again, that's what he leads out with. What's your best case, Zakir Naik? What's your best case for the prophethood of Muhammad? Oh, this passage where he would be stoned to death as a false prophet. That's my best case. What is this religion, man? What is this religion that it does this to people? It's tiring. Yep. And it gets tiring repeating the same uh, objections to the same arguments. But you know what? People need to hear it over and over and over again. As long as Muslims are going to repeat the same silly arguments it, yep. over and over again, we got to respond to it over and over again. Uh, so, I don't know what uh, Nita Mawar saying. Cold descendants of Isa are non-Israelites? Okay. So, Nita Mawar is not paying attention. Nita, here she's saying, because in Deuteronomy 2, verse 4 and 8, it says, Isa are the brothers of the Israelites. So, oh I don't goodness. know if Nita is a man or a woman and ignored everything oh we just goodness. said. Yeah, we uh, you basically ignored everything we said. We said that the phrase from um, among the you. The phrase from yeah, your among brothers, your brothers. Uh, in your midst, those phrase, in your midst, among your brothers, always use of Israelites, number one. Number two, even those examples backfire against Nita, and I hope she's listening and not just ignoring. You would not know that the Edomites are called the brothers of Israel if the text didn't say that. If the text didn't say the sons of Esau, your brothers, you would not know that the Edomites are called the brothers of Israel. So here's our challenge to you, Nita. Please pay attention. Why did Moses then qualify 
the term from among your brothers by saying, God will raise up a prophet from among your brothers, the Ishmaelites. God will raise up a prophet from among your brothers, the Edomites. So that example you used, Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 and 8, actually backfires against you. Because if the qualifier wasn't there, you're among your brothers, the Edomites, your brothers, the Edomites, you wouldn't know that the Edomites are called Israel's brothers. So here's our challenge to you, Nina, if you're pretending to be listening. Show us in Deuteronomy 18 the qualification. We just showed you contextually. From your midst, your brothers can only mean Israelites. That's how it's used elsewhere. But beyond that, your examples prove that if God wanted to make clear that the prophet is not like Moses in his ethnicity, that means he's like Moses in other years, but not in his ethnicity, then he would have qualified and said, I, would have raised, I will raise up a prophet from your brothers, the Ishmaelites, from your brothers, the Edomites. How come no qualification? Because it's clear contextually God is promising a succession of prophets from Israel to speak to the Israelites. Final challenge to you, Nina, and I hope you're listening. Prove to us, prove to us Muhammad is a son of Ishmael, a son of Abraham. Prove it. Show us in the Quran where it says Muhammad is a son of Abraham, a son of Ishmael. Ishmael is, an, is his ancestor. Don't waste your time. It's not there. You're assuming too much, and in assuming, you're destroying Islam, not helping it. But go ahead. Um, yeah, guys, how is this? N notice, notice the claims. Wow, wow, wow. Hmm. So Nita here says, David, you lied. Notice that's a strong accusation. I lied. The word, <laughs> brothers, used for non-Israelites. Guys, I said that. Go back and look. You can use brothers in other, way, in other ways. We said, as Sam pointed out, we said the phrase, from among your brothers, from among your brothers. That's used only of one's fellow Jews in context. Um, and so, but yes, other people are called brothers. Yeah, all kinds of people are your brothers. All kinds of people are your brothers in different senses, right? And then uh, right here, Nita says, but in Deuteronomy 18, 15, it does not say it doesn't, he says, addressing the children of Israel, and God did not say, from you. I'm not sure what the point here is, but let's go ahead and look at the passage. I think she's saying it, it doesn't say, from among your brothers there. We're quoting Deuteronomy 18.20, which is where Zachar Nike went. So let's just take one more look at it, Nita. Let's go ahead and take one more look here. What is it? Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. From among their brothers. Refers to fellow Jews. Like, matter of fact, you can, I mean, you can even go back even in the same chapter. You can look, you want, you want, you want to talk about context? Yeah, you want 15, to talk yeah. about context? Oh, I'm going, I'm going back to, uh, I'm going back to, 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 uh, to the beginning. Oh yeah. Verse, verse 18, the Levitical priests, all the tribe of Levi shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. <laughs> so this is talking about the, the, <laughs> The Edomites. the Edomites. Yeah, must be, right? Oh, must be talking about the Edomites here. It says among their brothers, right? It, it makes no sense. It makes no sense in context. And the idea down here, the idea down here, Nita, that this is, that here, where the context clearly referring to fellow Jews, and somehow you're just going to insert Muhammad in there, when Muhammad is one of the people who is completely ruled out as a prophet, he is guaranteed to be a false prophet by this passage. He would have been executed publicly because of this passage. This is the passage that proves Muhammad. And we'll call you a liar, David, for stating a fact and will misrepresent what you said because this is how things work in Islam. And guess what? You know what's amazing here, ladies and gentlemen? You know what's amazing? Zakir Naik's response would not have been any better than that. That is exactly, that is exactly what Zakir Naik would have done. We, so, Zachar Naik would have said, Deuteronomy 18, 18, this proves that Muhammad's a prophet. And Sam would have said, no, 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 no. Look, this right here, among your brethren, that's only used of one's fellow Jews. Uh, read the context. Then he would have given a bunch of other responses. Then Zachar Naik would have stood up and said, ha ha, Sam says that the word brothers can only be used of one's fellow Israelites. But here's a verse which talks about other, the Edomites being their brothers. And the Muslim crowd would have erupted into cheers and they would have run off saying Zakir and I completely obliterated Sam Shimon 
and they wouldn't have understood anything and they would have been completely wrong, completely yeah. misrepresented what Sam said. And that's what your best apologists do. How are we supposed to look at this and not conclude that this religion has nothing but deception going for it? How are we 100%. supposed to conclude that? Let's add icing on the cake to really destroy this argument because you can see, guys, why we repeat the same argument. Here's mm -hmm. Nita. I haven't seen him or her before. I'm assuming it's a Muslim. Using the same argument that we've demolished for more than 20 years. But you see why? We need to repeat it for a new generation of Muslims who are being brainwashed and lied to by Zakir Naik and others because they're not going back to the archives and listening to our sponsors. Now, for the sake of the Christians, learn all these arguments. Further, icing on the cake to show it cannot be Muhammad because, again, I'm going to give another example. Brothers in the immediate context means Israelite. <clears throat> Even the example she gave backfired against her because unless the text qualified it, the assumption is when it says your brother, assume it's Israel unless there's a qualifier, a qualification like your brother is the Edomites. But here, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 and 15, the very chapter before 18. Listen, Nita, because I got some objections for you to answer. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 and 15. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brothers. You shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Oh, the Israelites can only have a king who's from their brothers. And even says, not a foreigner. So unless the context suggests otherwise, from your midst, from among your brothers means Israelite, end of story. But Anita, Anita oh, not Anita, I'm sorry. Nita, it gets worse for you. Please pay attention. You do agree that the prophet, like Moses, his theology has to agree with Moses. Right, Nita? Because I want you to explain this for me. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, it says, Israel, God's covenant people, are the sons and daughters of the living God. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6, the Lord says that he is the one who birthed Israel, who created Israel, gave birth to Israel, confirmed in Deuteronomy 32, 18 and 20. So need to listen. Deuteronomy 13, 18 and 20, God says he's the rock who bore them. He is the God that gave birth to them spiritually. He's not a physical being. He's not a woman. He doesn't get pregnant. But the God of Israel gave birth to them spiritually. He birthed them to be his sons and daughters. So Israel are the children of God that God gave birth to, begot spiritually. Your Quran, chapter 5, verse 18, chapter 9, verse 30, and just to give one more for the sake of time, chapter 19, verses 88 to 93 says, Allah is not a father to the Jews and Christians. They are not his sons and daughters. Jesus is not the son of Allah. As there is not the son of Allah, you can only be a slave to Allah, and he's only your master. How then can the God of Muhammad be the God of Moses and Muhammad be a prophet like Moses? When Muhammad, uh, Moses says, my God is a spiritual father to his people. We are the sons and daughters of God. And he gave birth to us spiritually. Whereas Muhammad's God is a father to no one. He's not a spiritual father. He's not a father metaphorically. And you want me to believe that Muhammad is the prophet like Moses. And he contradicts the theology of Moses. And the final point, so we can bear this argument. Nira, this is now the burial of the Quran. So you better respond to these objections. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 of 4. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 of 4. God says, if a man divorces a woman and hands her a certificate of divorce, and she marries another, and the man that married her dies or divorces her, the first husband cannot take her back. That is an abomination to God. It is detestable to God. God abhors it. Your God, the God of Muhammad, in chapter 2 of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 230. Chapter 2, verse 230 says, When a Muslim irrevocably divorces his wife, he cannot take her back until she marries another one, and that other one has married her, had sex with her, and divorced her. That's what the Hadith says. He has to taste her honey. Then she can go back to her first husband. So the second husband, that marries that woman and has sex with her and divorces her, he's called muhallal, the one who made the woman halal to go back to her husband. What your God and your prophet says was halal, permissible, and the only way to return to her former husband, the true God says is an abomination, it is detestable, God hates your God and your Quran, 
for promoting something that's an abomination. And you still want to deceive yourself that Muhammad is a prophet like Moses. End of story. Bye-bye. Yeah, now, uh, <laughs> Aristotle here said, uh, David and Sam, I applaud you both for your patience. I recently had a discussion with two separate Muslims and felt like I was going to have an aneurysm. But, but guys, notice, right? N notice notice how much patience this does require because we're, we're trying to encourage everyone to be patient when you're talking to Muslims who've been manipulated and used and brainwashed by people like Zakir Naik. I mean, think about this. Guys, just think about this. Zakir Naik, what is your best argument that Muhammad's a prophet? Deuteronomy 18, verse 18 says that, Muhammad's a prophet. Well, it says from among from among your brothers. And in context, the only way that phrase is ever used is of fellow Jews. And if you read the context, it doesn't make any sense apart from fellow Jews. He's talking about your fellow Jews, right? He's saying, hey, you know, it's talking about, it, it's the Jews who are requesting this, right? The Jews in context in this passage are saying, we don't want to see God face to face. We'll, we'll die. It's scary. It's scary. It says, no problem. That's why God is going to raise up prophets for you, All right? So God's going to raise up a prophet for you. For who? For the Jews. And Muslims want to say, nope, from among your brothers there means from, from the Ishmaelites or Edomites or whatever you want to say, from other people, when that makes no sense in context. And what does Muhammad say? He says, well, hey, the Jews are going to be hiding until we show up and slaughter them all. And they're going to be hiding behind, they're going to be hiding behind trees and rocks. And the Muslims are going to come kill them. That's what Muhammad says about the Jews. This is the guy. This is the guy who's, who's sent to to be the to, to help the Jews, right? Muhammad. And then in the very passage, in the same passage, Deuteronomy 18:20, Muhammad can't be a prophet and he would have been stoned to death. And what's the Muslim response? No, it does here this the word brothers the word brother can be I can walk down the street and say, "Hey brother, that doesn't mean that what the phrase from among your brothers when it's used by Moses referring to one's fellow Jews refers to Muhammad." Do you understand how ridiculous this is? Muhammad is completely utterly, totally ruled out as a prophet and would have been stoned to death by, by Moses. And what do you say? Oh, it's clearly promoting Muhammad. This is why it takes patience, ladies and gentlemen. Because and even, by the way, yeah. even now, I guarantee but, Nita, Nita, Nita is not getting any of this. Not getting any of this. And still, just, just because Zucker and Ike said it, just because Zucker and Ike said it, it must be true. Why? Because the alternative is Zucker and Ike is an obvious false prophet for Muslims, right? He's, he, he's, a, he's a false prophet leading you guys astray. Right? Because yeah. keep in mind, he has to be something like that. Otherwise, you shouldn't be taking every word he says as infallible truth. Right? You guys treat these guys like your modern day prophets, where you can't object to anything they say. Notice all you have to do is a Muslim say, wow, Zakir Naik made a really stupid, stupid, idiotic point there. Uh -huh. He needs to drop this argument because he's embarrassing us by pointing to passages which say that Muhammad would have been stoned to death. And he's pointing to these passages and prove that Muhammad's a prophet. Stop embarrassing us, dude. If you want to say the Bible's corrupt, say the Bible's corrupt. But don't say that this, this points to Muhammad. That's ridiculous, right? That's all you have to do. Instead, you can't get you can't get your minds around the fact that it could be wrong about something. Why? You guys are you guys are you guys have made idols of these guys. This is sickening. Go ahead, Sam. No, I'm just saying, just to confirm, every time I have to deal with the same objections that Muslims bring out, I get emotionally drained like mm -hmm. right now i'm really drained because it tires me out but by the grace of jesus by the power of the Holy spirit we keep doing it we endure because we trust the spirit will use it to touch some muslim to come to his or her senses and escape this damnable evil ideology honestly but it's draining it does yep. drain me but we're doing it i'm enduring like right now i'm like oh my goodness is that Naik and his arguments again but for the sake of the lord we press on so yep and um uh, by the way so, sort of icing Icing on all the cake here. Icing on all okay. the cake. By the way, Rob Christian, Rob Christian saying that uh, uh, he was unsubscribed from my channel, even though that wasn't him. And then someone else confirmed saying that they can't even, that uh, when they go to their page, I'm not even listed as, as live now. So no, obviously, yeah. so obviously a thousand people found us, but um, most people are saying they weren't notified and so on. And, and yeah. some are saying they can't even find it. They can't even find it yeah. now. They were just, they were on it. There were, they were somehow on it already or something yeah, like they're, that. Yeah, they're doing something to your channel because uh, usually you get about 1,500, 1,700. But like I said, there was no announcement. You're going live today even for me. So something's yeah. going on again. Yeah, pretty pretty tricky. Yeah. All right, but the, the icing on the cake on, on this issue, think about this. So Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. According to that, Moses would have, would have had Muhammad executed as a false prophet for delivering the satanic verses. And I, I mentioned that fortunately... 
fortunately for Muhammad, not for everyone else, but fortunately for Muhammad, he delivered the satanic verses among a bunch of pagans who were overjoyed that he was promoting polytheism. So he didn't get, he didn't get sentenced to death for that. But think about how Muhammad actually died, because this is poetic justice. How does Muhammad die? He's yeah. poisoned by a Jewish woman. Yeah. <laughs> He's poisoned by a Jewish woman. And remember what she, remember what she said, Sam? I, yeah. reas I reasoned that if you were a prophet, this poison would not harm you. But if you were just a king, in other words, if you're a false prophet, and you're just, you're just some military leader taken over, then I would rid the world of you. Muhammad said, Allah will never allow you to do it. And then Muhammad died from the poison anyway, after spending three years wallowing in freakish misery. Muhammad died yeah. being poisoned by a Jewish woman who reasoned that if he's a false prophet, as he is according to Deuteronomy 18.20, if he's a false prophet, this poison will take him out. And if he's a true prophet, it won't. He'll be warned. Instead, Muhammad died from that poison. It's, like, it? it's, 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 it's like we're sitting here. How many different ways... Is Muhammad a false prophet, according to this yeah. passage, which is Zakir Naik's best case for Muhammad? It's like, and, and, and guys, it's every, every one of these passages that we're going to look at. It's like, hey, here are 10 different ways that Muhammad's a false prophet, according to this passage. Let me go to this passage to prove that Muhammad's a true prophet. Amazing. What a, what a religion, man. Good. But here's what's ironic. If you remember Shu'aib, he actually used that incident to prove, see, Muhammad is not a false prophet. He didn't die immediately. Mm -hmm. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. He he used it. He tied it to Jeremiah, saying you're you're, you're a false prophet. You're going to die within yeah. a year. So notice, notice again. We we never we never got to that because then he started saying you know the Bible's lies. But I mean, think about what he's doing. If you say you're a prophet and you don't die within a year, Doctor <laughs> Shuaib just said you're a true prophet. So yeah. Joseph Smith was a true prophet according to Doctor Shuaib. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is a true prophet, according to Dr. Shuaib. Now, notice, as soon as, as soon as Sam would have brought that up, he would, uh, uh, you can't trust Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a liar. And Moses is a liar. They're all liars. Everyone's a liar. This is hilarious stuff, man. This What does it, what does this religion do to people, man? What does it do to people? Wow. All right. Well, I guess that was Deuteronomy. We're done with it. Now, if we don't finish all his points, you may save some for backup in case people don't show up Thursday and Friday. Yes, yeah, that, that's that's true. Um, so, matter of fact, let's go through some of the rest of these kind of yeah, rapid yeah, rapid fire. Yeah, we'll yeah. keep it rapid yeah, fire. Song of Solomon, we've done, we've exhausted. But Isaiah, you mentioned twenty nine twelve, right? Isaiah twenty nine twelve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to make those points, what you say about it, then I can show the theology again. That remember, if he's a prophet like Isaiah, and Isaiah, he's got to agree with theology. But what do you say about that, man? Come on, it says, and well, the prophet. Yeah. I mean, we can we, we can obviously go through the entire passage, and I think I have a video where I go through where I go See through you. the entire the entire passage. But guys, once again, just look at just look at what these verses say. Look at this, how, Muslims. How are you not embarrassed that a guy many of you regard as your chief apologist would give this as his response when he's when he's given an opportunity to present his best case for Muhammad? He goes, Deuteronomy 18, which according to which Muhammad's a false prophet, and Deuteronomy 29.12, I mean, uh, uh, Isaiah 29.12, according to which Muhammad is a stubborn rebel against God, and <laughs> where are you getting profit out of this, right? So guys, so uh, let, let me just give you, the, let me give you the, the Muslim argument here, right? So look at verse 12. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. Oh, did you catch that? They're going to give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this. He says, I cannot read. Oh, my goodness. The angel Gabriel showed up to give Muhammad the book and told Muhammad to read. And Muhammad said, I can't read. You see that? This is a prophecy, a fulfilled prophecy, because Isaiah 29, 12 was saying that there's going to be a prophet. And this prophet, this prophet is going to say, I can't read when he's given a book. He's going to say, I can't read. So this, this is miraculous proof that Muhammad's a true prophet. Guys, my goodness, Muslims, I mean... Uh, this is perfect illustration of the 99-1 rule. I mean, for, for real, Zucker Nike's audience, it's more like the, the 100 and 0 rule. He knows that zero of his followers will ever look up what he's saying. If they did, they should be ashamed. They should be saying, how can we listen to this absolute horrible deceiver to say to, to believe this what this guy says? Every passage he tells us to go to tells us that Muhammad's a false prophet or that he should be put to death. And this is this is your main guy, guys. Uh, we don't want to read the entire passage again. I have a video that going through this, but let's just let's just go. If you can get a general idea of what's going on, 
So uh, you have at the beginning here, 29.1, Ah, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David encamped, add year to year, let the feast run their round, yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be moaning and lamentation, and she shall be to me like an Ariel, which means sort of like a, a place where you, you, you know, burn things and, you know, you've got the ashes and so on. And I will encamp against you all around. It will besiege you with towers, and I will raise siege works against you, and you will be brought low. From the earth you shall speak, and from the dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come up from the ground like the voice of a ghost, and from the dust your speech shall whisper. God is talking about judging. Judging Jerusalem. He's talking about the judgment to come. Right? So you have you have uh you know you have the, the northern tribes and then you have um you have Judea. God's talking about the judgment that's coming, right? So he gives this revelation through Isaiah saying that they're going to be judged, right? And you get down to verse 11. And the vision of all this, all this what? All this judgment that I'm talking about is coming upon you, to you, the Jews. And this vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book. There you have it, book. What book? What book is delivered to a person? And the vi and this vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. In context, what is this saying? It's talking about the stubbornness of the people when their prophets come to them, warning them about judgment, and they make excuses for why they're rejecting the revelation. They're making excuses for stubbornly rejecting the revelation. Now, now pay attention to verses 11 and 12 again. And the vision of all this, what? He just talked about it. The vision of what's about to happen to them. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. The book is sealed. So it's like a book and you're delivering it to someone. When men give it to one who can read saying, read this, he says, I cannot for it is sealed. In other words, he makes an excuse. Hey, this book is sealed up. I can't, I can't read it. So he makes an excuse for why he rejects it, why he rejects the book. And when they give it to the when they give the book to one who cannot read, verse 12, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. Who is this talking about? Is this talking about a prophet? No. The prophet is the one giving the revelation, and the people are the one making excuses for why they reject the revelation given by the prophet. So if this is Muhammad, as Zakir Naik claims, Zakir Naik says, this is Muhammad. Muhammad right here. He's the one talked about. Well, notice in verse 12, this is not talking about a prophet refusing to read. This is not talking about a prophet making excuses. This is talking about a man who rejects the words of the prophets that are revealed to him, who stubbornly makes excuses for rejecting the prophecies that are revealed to him. So if Zakir Naik wants to say, this is talking about Muhammad, great. Muhammad's not a prophet. He's someone who's in rebellion against the prophets. The prophets are, have revealed revelations, and Muhammad stubbornly makes excuses because of his illiteracy. He, he, he counts this as an excuse for rejecting the true revelations of God. This is Zakir Naik telling you that Muhammad was a stubborn rebel against God, making excuses for why he rejected God's true revelations. I say amen. Amen to this. All right, Sam, what do you think? Just let me add the icing on the cake, because we've already done this. We've belabored the point. But yep. for the sake of people, remember this, Christians. Even if you don't remember the context, the context is not a prophecy of prophets to come. Keep this in mind. Would a prophet in the Old Testament prophesy the coming of someone who would contradict their theology? So keep that in mind. If Muhammad is this prophet that Isaiah supposedly announced would come, and it's not, as David showed you, he cannot contradict the theology of Isaiah. So if you're quoting Isaiah, then you're going to have to stuck, be stuck with Isaiah. Muhammad says his God is not a father to his people, spiritually or metaphorically. But in Isaiah 63, 16, folks, remember this. The God of Isaiah is a spiritual father to his people, and he spiritually begets them, and he <clears throat> preserves them and sustains them as a father does to his children. Here, Isaiah 63, 16. For you are, you are our father, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. Isaiah 64, verse 8. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our son. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands. So number one, Isaiah's God is a spiritual father to his people. 
He spiritually begets them, not physically, not sexually, and he provides for them, sustains them, and protects them as a father does for his children. So that's number one. Number two, Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. In the Quran, chapter 112, verse 3, remember this, chapter 112, verse 3, yalet wa Allah neither begets nor is begotten. Even though in the context of the Quran, it is condemning the pagan understanding that Allah sires children sexually, or he's like one of the gods who is produced by a god and a goddess. And we condemn that as well. We condemn that as well. That's false teaching. But still, with that said, some Muslims like to misapply it to deny the eternal generation of the sun. Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. Christians, please, this is now archived. Make sure you listen to this because I want you to learn these arguments and this will end the misappeal to Isaiah. Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. For to us a child is born. Ask anyone who reads Hebrew. The phrase, for to us a child is born, is yelet yuled. That's the Hebrew cognate of 112.3. Lam yelet walam yuled. Yelet and yelet. The Hebrew Arabic cognates. So here it says, a child born, yelet child, yulad, born. To us the son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Notice the name of the child who is born, a human baby, a human child is going to grow up to be a human man, a, a male figure. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, wonderful counselor, mighty God, El Gibor, El God Gibor. The Arabic equivalent would be Allah al-Jabbar or Ilah al-Jabbar, names of Allah and that cannot be given to a creature. So a child is born who is El-Gibor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And who is the child? Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So a child is born to sit on David's throne forever. That's why even Jewish tradition, rabbinic tradition, though some try to say it's Hezekiah, can't be Hezekiah. Rabbinic tradition says this is Messiah, Mashiach. Child born to sit on David's throne forever, whose name is El Gibor, the mighty God. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 21, folks. One of the names of Jehovah, the Lord, is mighty God. His name is mighty God. So now, Muslims, how can Muhammad be a prophet announced by Isaiah when Isaiah says the mighty God of Israel will be born as a child, will be born as a child, the mighty God himself, and that God is a father to, to his people, all of which Muhammad contradicts. Muhammad is condemned by Isaiah, not prophesied by Isaiah. So much for Isaiah. That's the second one. All right. Um... Well, it's 9.50 here. Should we uh, should we give a short version of one more? And then yeah, Zucker, Zucker makes Wasn't it Zuck, Song of Solomon? We can finish that. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that was it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the remaining one. And then, matter of fact, um, since we have Muslim uh, Muslims here to join us for the next couple days, basically we can keep the additional Zucker Knight clips on hand in case someone doesn't show up, and then we could just yeah. do more more uh, responses to Zucker Knight. Uh, but here... We have some Muslims who say they want to be... Guys, I, I don't know why we have so many people in the chat every day who want to join us live, and then no one bothers to do the difficult yeah. work of sending me an email saying, hey, I want to join you live. Uh, here's my here's my Skype name. Guys, I mean, really, I can't take it. I just can't take it seriously. When I tell you in my videos, here's exactly how to contact me. You never contact me, but you come to the chat and say, oh, we're ready. We're, we're ready. What's the problem? So, Shah Saeed, you said, come on. you said you want to come on. And uh, notice the chest thumping. You, you, you've never met a Muslim like me. I will make you say shahada. Come on, let's do this. Sounds like a Muhammad hijab fan. <laughs> All right. One more clip. One more clip, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, wait, no. We, we already watched the clip. So we just have the passage yeah. from... It's a Song of Solomon 5.16. Yeah, Song of Solomon 5.16. Yeah, yeah, let me get some water again. You go ahead on a second. Right here. One second. Go ahead. Do it. All right. Water again. All right. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, so let's go ahead and get Song of Solomon 5.16 pulled up. Song of Solomon 5.16. Wow, here we go. So here we have, once again, for the 50 billionth time, for the 50 billionth time, Solomon's bride. And, you know, to be fair, we point out that there are a couple of alternative 
interpretations of this. One, it's, you know, uh, the bride of some shepherd and uh, Solomon is, uh, you know, the thir sort of third character and stuff like that. So you have a couple of different interpretations, but none of them, none of them at all make sense if you're talking about Muhammad. Not <laughs> one of them, not one of them. All right. So let's go ahead and scroll down until we get to... Look at verse 8, by the way. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am sick with love. So she's talking about the, talking to the daughters of Jerusalem here. What you doing? She's talking to she's talking to she's talking to the daughters of Jerusalem. This is Solomon's wife here, supposedly. Others, what is your beloved more than another beloved, O most beautiful among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus adjure us? So, what are they asking? Hey, woman, from 10th century, from 10th century BC, you're talking about your beloved. Who? According to the, the main interpretation of Solomon, uh, according to the alternative uh, interpretation, is talking about some shepherd here. In the 10th century BC, 1600 years before Muhammad, right? Saying, tell us, this guy that you're in love with, why is he so different? What is your beloved more than another beloved, O most beautiful among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus adjure us? So she talks about her beloved, the one she is in love with. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold, set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are, alaba are alabaster columns, set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So this woman, 10th century BC, is asked why the one she's in love with is better than other men. She gives this description of his body and concludes with, his mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. And Zakir Naik, as part of his main defense of Muhammad, his main proof that Muhammad is a true prophet, uses verse 16 to say that his mouth is most sweet and he is all to, he is Muhammad. Zakir Naik says that altogether desirable should be should be uh, shouldn't be translated because it is actually the name Muhammad. Why is it the name Muhammad? Well, the Hebrew word is Mahmadim, and that's close enough to Muhammad that uh, Zakir Naik says that this is actually a reference and Muhammad is mentioned by name here. So notice. If we just take Zakir Naik seriously, then this woman, when she is asked, 10th century BC, why she's in love with the guy she's in love with, Zakir Naik says she's actually talking about Muhammad, who was not born for 1,500 more years, more than 15, more than 15 centuries later after this woman. So she's in love with, the guy she's describing is Muhammad, who wasn't born for more than 15 centuries after this. That's who she's talking about. Uh, Sam, what are, what are, what are your... Uh, just the, yeah. the, the level yeah. of absurdity. Yeah, yeah. What do you think yeah. about this? <laughs> yeah, so she's lusting for another man other than her husband, so she's committing adultery, unless Muhammad was there inhabiting the body of her husband. Because, remember, well... Yeah. Just real quickly, guys, I want you to understand that the word is plural. It's Mahmadim. Mm -hmm. Now, they'll explain away as a plural of majesty. But you know what's interesting, folks? Guys, make sure you remember the argument. So you're saying Mahmadim, the plural of Mahmad, is Muhammad by name. They'll say yes. So let's be consistent. Let's see where the word Mahmad, because remember, Mahmad to them sounds like Muhammad, Let's see where the singular form appears. Why are you going to the plural? Because here it's Mahmadim, plural of Mahmad. Let's see if Mahmad appears elsewhere in the singular form. Because after all, wouldn't the singular form Mahmad more closely correspond to Muhammad? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what, folks? 
here, Ezekiel 24, 16. Pay attention. Ezekiel 24, 16. In Song of Songs, Mahmadim was a man that Solomon's wife or the shepherd's wife was in love with. So either because Muhammad's spirit was in her husband or she was lusting for someone else committing adultery centuries before he's born. But here, Muhammad turns out to be a woman. So this is one of the miracles of Islam. Muhammad was the first transgender. He can change genders depending on the context to prove he's a prophet. Because in Ezekiel 24, 16, the word Mahmad is used for Ezekiel's wife, whom God was going to allow to die as a sign of what he was going to do to the temple in Jerusalem, which was the Mahmad, the desire of the Jews. Here it is, Ezekiel 24, verse 16. Son of man, behold, I'm about to take the Muhammad of your eyes. The word in English is delight, Ezekiel 24, 16. Hebrew, Mahmad, son of man, Ezekiel, I'm about to take the Muhammad of your eyes, the delight of your eyes, away from you at a stroke, and you shall not mourn nor weep, nor shall you your tears run down. Now, help me understand the logic here, David. Since Mahmadim, plural, means Muhammad, then Mahmad surely must mean Muhammad, because it's singular, like Muhammad is. But here, Ezekiel's wife is Mahmad. Are they trying to tell me that Ezekiel, his wife was actually Muhammad as a woman, so that in a previous life, Muhammad was female, so that Muhammad's spirit can transmigrate in different bodies, take on different genders, and become at one time someone's husband and another time someone's wife? Yeah, guys, um, I mean, seriously here, I mean, Muslims, we're trying, to, we're trying to help you here. This should be a tremendous embarrassment. This should be a tremendous embarrassment. Follow the reasoning here. You have this Hebrew word, Mahmad. It means something desirable or lovely. It's used in all kinds of places in the Old Testament. Zakar and I goes to the one place where it's, it's actually plural. It's actually used in the plural, Mahmadim. And says, this is talking, you can't, you shouldn't translate a name. This is talking about Muhammad. Well, following the reasoning, obviously, if when it's plural, it's talking about Muhammad, then when it's singular, it's talking about Muhammad. Sam goes to Ezekiel 24, 16, where the word is used of Ezekiel's wife. So let me get this straight. If the word Muhammad is actually a name, Muhammad, then Ezekiel's wife is called Muhammad. But that's the name Muhammad. So Ezekiel's wife is Muhammad. That means Muhammad is married to Ezekiel. So it's wow. either it's so Muhammad is either yeah he, he he's got to be transgender or wow. Muhammad's just a woman or or what, what's going on here right? This should wow. be humiliating to you. This should be absolutely oh my goodness. If I take what Zakir Naik said seriously, if I take it seriously for two seconds, I have to conclude. That Muhammad's a false prophet who would be stoned to death, who need who deserve to be stoned to death according to Deuteronomy 18, which Zakir Naik appealed to, and that Muhammad is it was a stubborn rebel against God. He's in rebellion against God. He's making excuses for why he rejects the true revelations of God, and 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 that's what he is according to Isaiah 29. And now we have that Muhammad is a time traveling transgender who was <laughs> lusting, who was lusting after a woman who died 15 centuries before he did, which also makes him a necrophile. <laughs> and he, and he, <laughs> and he is, he's Ezekiel's wife and Muhammad is the woman in that relationship. Guys, how do you not say, dude, Zuckerberg, you need to shut up. Can you just shut up? Everything <laughs> you say is an embarrassment to us. This is horrible. What you're saying about your prophet guys. It's, it's insane here, but we actually have more respect for your prophet than to treat him like this, right? It's your apologist. No one, no one says more offensive things about Muhammad than your top apologists, right? We call, we say, hey, man, he's a false prophet. Hey, he, you know, look at this stupid stuff that Muhammad said. Your guys call him a time-traveling, transgendered false prophet <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's a necrophile, right? That's yeah, your guys. Yeah, dude, yeah. And then, and you don't even get it and you just cheer you just cheer him on this is this is absolutely this is absolutely insane and and then you look at this and say wait a minute you guys have had 14 centuries to put together your case for muhammad and then a guy that many muslims would regard as their top apologist you you, you put him on you, you sit him down and say what is your best argument for muhammad oh you want my best argument from for muhammad I'll tell you my best argument for Muhammad. I'll give you my best case for the prophet Muhammad. 
Here are a bunch of Bible passages that if you bothered to read them, you would have to conclude that Muhammad is a time-traveling, false prophet, transgendered necrophile. Yeah. <laughs> and so, let me leave so, them at this point. So please, so, so please don't read them. Please don't read them. And that's what Zakarnak really wants, right? He wants you to believe in anything he says without ever looking into anything he says. And that is not the mark of a good apologist, my friends. Go ahead. And let me leave you with this point. Lord willing, the Muslims will show up. If not, we'll do his New Testament passages, which really is going to make him look bad, even worse. If Mahmadim is Muhammad's name because it sounds close enough to Muhammad, this is what we call the phonic fallacy. Because if you ask a Muslim, Muhammad, the root for Muhammad, Hamid, what does it mean? They'll say it means praise. Praise. It's like when you say Alhamdulillah. But whereas the word Mahmad means desirable, lovely. There is a Hebrew word for praise. It's not <clears throat> Mahmad. It's actually when you say Hallelujah, Hallel. In Hebrew, Hallel means praise. Whereas in Arabic, it's Hamid. So they're banking on the word sounding close enough. Mahmad Muhammad. Even though they mean different things in Hebrew and Arabic. Let's play that game. Guys, don't take my word for it. In the Bible, there are references to mice. There are references to rats. The word for mice, for rat in Hebrew, is akhbar. Akhbar. Now let's play that game, folks. That means if Mahmad, because it sounds like Muhammad, is Muhammad, that, that means when Muslims say Allahu Akbar, because Akbar sounds like Akbar, they're actually saying Allah is a mouse, Allah is a rat, Allah is a rat, Allah is a mouse. In fact, Allah is mighty mouse. Here I come to save the day. There you go. There you go. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. People, and, and we ask the Muslims, why won't Zakir Naik ever face a single actual Christian debater in his entire life? Just one. I mean, does he does he really want, I mean, he'll eventually die, right? We all eventually die. Does he want to eventually die not being able to say that he faced one actual Christian debater in his entire career? Does he want to go down in history like that? Um, and you Muslims have to say, yeah, you, you were all, because you Christians were all beneath him. You are all beneath him. You aren't good enough for him. Guys, you see what happens when someone actually examines his arguments. So, so tell me that. Tell me this, Muslims. Be, be, be serious. Be honest here. Stop treating this guy like a prophet. And treat him like a human being who has agendas, who has, who has things that he's trying to accomplish. Um, do you think that the reason he avoids stepping on stage with a Christian debater is, A, because oh, Christians just aren't good enough to face him. Or B, because he knows if he ever spouted this idiotic nonsense up on stage, he would be instantly exposed as a fraud and a coward and a charlatan who is saying such offensive stuff about Muhammad because that's his career. And by, by now, he, he has to know it, right? He has to know that all you have to do is read these passages and it is thoroughly humiliating to Muhammad. He has to know that by now. And he keeps saying this stuff anyway, which means he knows he is a deceiver. He knows he's lying and he does it because it's, it's just his job. It's his job to lie, to give Muslims comforting thoughts about their religion, to be paid tons of money for doing it and to just completely lie to them. Which one do you think is more likely? A, that the reason he doesn't face Christians is because he's too good for them. Or B, he would be completely humiliated the second he stepped up on stage with a Christian who would actually tell people what this stuff says in context. Which one do you think it is? I know I know what I think. Exactly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we had all we have all kinds of problems. I've gotten dozens and dozens of messages um, saying things like this. LaJoya says your video isn't showing up on subscriptions. Tons of that. Exactly. They're out of nowhere, right? A lot of people coming in late saying they 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 are not getting notifications and so on. They have to find out about it some other way. But uh, and, and yeah, last night, last night we had between 27 and 2800 people live. Now we're under a, we're under a thousand. So yeah, they're doing something. They're obviously fishy stuff men. going. Yeah. And the reason I'm saying this is because last night vocab got his entire channel demonetized. Clear. It's clear they're coming after clear. They're coming after us doing uh, different things. Hopefully doesn't uh, hopefully that doesn't keep up. But tomorrow, just keep in mind, we're going live tomorrow one way or another. 
we're going live. We have a Muslim, a young Muslim, who wants to have a discussion with us. Uh, if he shows up, we're going to have a discussion. If he doesn't, we'll, we'll continue talking about Muhammad. Just know we're here tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. So even if you don't get the notification, um, yep, just try and find it. All right, any uh, final thoughts, Sam, before we log out? Just, guys, keep praying. Like you see, if they're going to come after us and censor us, we got to find an alternate platform. Ask the Lord Jesus, keep these these doors open that no man can shut so we can continue to preach the gospel, destroy Islam, see Muslims get saved, and pray the Lord Jesus will preserve us and our families for his glory, that we walk worthy of him and love him first and foremost, and not just worry about ministry, because Jesus Christ is worthy that we love him, live for him, and die for him, and that's why we preach to everyone, because their only hope of salvation is Jesus Christ. And may the Lord Jesus save these Muslims, bring them out of the darkness of Islam into his glorious light, and may he increase in us. We love you, Lord Jesus. That's it. So keep us in prayer. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us in spite of some of the difficulties. And Lord willing, we'll catch you all tomorrow.